to that one. Okay, sir, we are live. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning, friends. Uh, wish you a warm Sunday morning. Not got any questions. I'll find out. Okay, fine. I'll welcome to the fifth edition of Sunday morning series of webinars by Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society. Uh, this is a series of eight uh, weekly webinars on Sunday morning, which is a brainchild of our dear president and founder, Dr. Ram Prabhu. We have had extremely successful four webinars uh, in the past with a viewership of more than 1,800 people. We have been addressing various pertinent topics for general orthopedic surgeons. Continuing day, today, we have another very, very interesting aspect of orthopedics that we are going to address, and that is bone tumors. We general orthopedics are generally the first point of contact for patients of bone tumors. Uh, it is extremely important in today's era that we pick them up properly, have a very high index of suspicion, and more than that, put them through the exact sequence of investigations and treatment, because very often if you jumble there, the final treatment gets messed up. Dr. Chetan Anchan, uh, who needs no introduction, he's an ortho-onco surgeon practicing in Bombay Hospital and suburbs of Mumbai, uh, has set up an excellent faculty of orthopedic surgeons, radiologists, and others who are going to throw light on various aspects of primary management of the common bone tumors, which will definitely help us in our approach towards bone tumors when we get back to clinics. Before that, I would request Dr. Ram Prabhu to say a few words. Yeah. Dr. Thank Ram you. Prabhu, sir. Yeah, thank you, Satish. Thank you very much. And I think uh, this last four webinars that we've had have been excellent. And I must thank the sponsors Swizera for it, and we have Ortho TV, which has supported supported our uh, uh, webinars. So we must thank the Ortho TV team of Dr. Neeraj Bijlani and Dr. Ashok Sham, who have helped us in setting up these webinars. Uh, we've had really excellent webinars so far, and we've had more than 1,500 participants, and I expect the same similar kind of participation today also. I think this webinar has become a rage across uh, Mumbai and lots of people have started approaching us that they would like to have different topics and they have suggested different topics that shows the popularity of these webinars and thanks Dr. Satish Mutha for this concept and we have got it together, uh, all, all of us. So we have excellent team of Dr. Manish Agarwal, Dr. Chetan Anchan and his team who are going to give us the insights into the orthopedic oncology and I'm sure they are going to explain and uh, are all going to answer your questions which are pertaining to oncology as a subject. Thank you very much. Over to you, Satish and Dr. Chetan. Dr. Chetan? Chetan? Nikhil, is Dr. Chetan with us? No, sir. I think he is not with us. I think the net, due to network issue, he is not featuring, sir. Give me one second, okay? Yeah, sir. Now, Chetan, sir, has come, sir. Chetan, sir, has come. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Chetan? Do you have a network issue? Just one second. Hello, Chetan. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? My network is uh, unstable. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. We can. So Chetan, can we start?
Dr. Mutha, I think Chetan has a bandwidth issue. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. What is it, Peter? Yogesh, I think you can take over and uh, yeah, get you. started. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Yogesh. Yes. Let's do that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, very good Sunday morning to all of you. Uh, till Sunday, uh, till Chetan is able to join us again. I'm here. I'm back. I'm uh, back. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Chetan, yeah, over yeah, to I'm you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry for this. Anyway, uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank Mumbai Sabarman Orthopedic Society President Dr. Ram Prabhu and Secretary Dr. Sachin Mutha for this opportunity to conduct a webinar on orthopedic oncology. I thank my faculty and panelists for today's program for being so kind enough to agree to participate, taking time off their well-earned Sunday holiday. I owe special thanks to Dr. Manish Agarwal sir for managing to pull in Ms. Karen Shepherd, consultant orthopedic and oncological surgeon at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Orthopedic Hospital in Oswestry, England, who in turn was so gracious to accept this invitation to deliver a talk in this program at such a short notice. Last but not the least, I thank all those who have taken time off on a Sunday morning to attend this webinar. I'm certain it will be worth your while. Knowing that a large number of general orthopedic surgeons will be attending this webinar, it has been designed to be of use to you in your regular practice. I strongly believe that if you follow just the basic principles of orthopedic oncology, as will be explained to you by the eminent faculty, you will rarely face trouble dealing with a patient having tumor of the musculoskeletal system. Without wasting any more time, I invite Professor Dr. Ashish Gulia, consultant orthopedic oncologist at Tata Memorial Hospital, for delivering his talk on principles of orthopedic oncology a brief overview of the workup of a patient with suspected bone tumor. Ashish? Thanks, Chitan. Okay. I need to share my screen and I cannot host disabled participant screen sharing. So can somebody sort this, please? Nikhil, no, can you, you can do that, sir. Okay, let me know when it is done so that I can share my screen. Sir, please share now. Good morning, everyone, and uh, special thanks to uh, Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Association, uh, Dr. Ram Prabhu and Dr. Sadish Mutha to put this program together and uh, Chetan Anshan to organize this and, and invite me and giving me opportunity to share with you guys a few uh, learning tips and points that if a suspected bone tumor case comes to your clinic, how you're going to approach it. So as we all know, bone tumors are extremely rare. The exact uh, reason why they happen is not known to us. Uh, but what we know is that they arise from, um, most probably they arise from the uh, growing skeleton. And that's why these tumors are more common in uh, first and second decade. There have been various uh, theories which have been postulated, but none of them have been proved and they are still considered as de novo in generation. Coming straight to what you see in your clinic, you see lots of benign bone tumors, uh, which may include uh, very latent non-ossifying fibromas to very aggressive giant cell tumors in your clinic. And as you can see in these pictures, along with them, to make you more confused, you also see various primary bone tumors, uh, which are uh, malignant. Uh, like osteosarcoma and even sarcoma. And you also have to encounter in, elder, in elderly patients, the metastatic bone disease. So everything creates a bit of confusion when you are in a clinic. And this is where we require a systematic approach to sort these queries. And we need to understand why it is so important. When, when you broadly classify bone tumors into benign and malignant, and you look at their treatment protocol, you will understand that the treatment which you offer for a benign tumor is completely different from a malignant bone tumor. In benign tumor, you want to do a function preserving surgery where you can go intralesionally and then can save the joint and the bone as much as possible and can control the disease. 
but the same doesn't hold good true for a malignant bone tumor where you have to excise the tumor completely where you are not looking at saving some part of the bone where your oncology comes as uh, the uh, the first parameter and then reconstruction you think about and hence the management is completely different if you try to treat a malignant bone tumor like a benign bone tumor you will end up in local recurrences eventually losing limbs not just limbs but also patient's life as well and hence it is extremely important that we evaluate these lesions which comes to your clinic very very carefully in a very systematic manner so i have just put this uh, a simple algorithm if you see any uh, suspected lesion which may be lytic uh, which may have some sort of uh, aggressive features like periosteal reaction you need to evaluate these lesions with the help of appropriate imaging and x rays being the first one and you need to understand whether this is arising from a bone or it is arising from soft tissue once you know it is arising from the bone you need to differentiate uh, you need to differentiate tumors from other differentials and the most common are infections metabolic disorders and the, and some of the developmental disorders once you have done that and you and you understand and you realize that this looks like a, a bone tumor per se then you need to broadly classify them or broadly differentiate them into a benign one or a malignant one as i mentioned earlier uh, when i was showing you a few x rays i told you that benign tumor can also be very you know they can be just a incidental finding where you find uh, latent tumors like non ossifying fibroma and they can be active like uh, uh, a simple bone cyst and they can be pretty aggressive like giant cell tumor of bone aneurysmal bone cyst and chondroblastomas so you need to differentiate and when you look at the x rays carefully when you understand the history carefully you will be able to do that when you come to malignant bone tumors the broad classification what you need to understand is that you want to differentiate a primary bone tumor from a secondary metastatic bone disease because again here the management will be completely different so when you are evaluating a bone lesion your aims of evaluation is to have an early detection so that you can correctly diagnose these lesions when you have diagnosed this you can optimally stage depending upon your diagnosis and you can initiate the right treatment as early as possible in the right sequence so these are the aims for your evaluation of a bone tumor diagnosis of bone tumor as we have seen multiple times earlier in this tv everyone has spoken that you cannot just diagnose bone tumor only on histine clinical examination or by just looking at the x-ray there has to be a synergy between these three things which form the strong pillars to have a correct diagnosis and it, this involves a, a, a detailed history and clinical examination you need to have appropriate imaging and your clinical radiological diagnosis must be confirmed by histopathological examination by doing a biopsy when if, if, if you are planning to do any intervention so let's look at history and examination quickly we need to look at the patient's age where the tumor is located whether it is epiphysis metaphysis or diaphysis and history history essentially involves the progression of the disease how quickly the tumor is growing or the swelling is growing or how slowly it has been growing uh, since how many months or weeks the symptoms have been there which will give you a clue about benign or a malignant pathology so this uh, i have enumerated few of the malignant and benign tumors depending upon the decades as and as you can see that most of the benign and malignant primary bone tumors fall in first decade as we grow older giant cell tumor appear as the most common benign tumor in the mature skeleton and chondrosarcomas as the most common malignant bone tumor and after the age of 40 we need to suspect metastatic bone disease as one of the most common lesions in the bone as i mentioned earlier this picture is actually available on the net and the books everywhere else location of the tumor is extremely important i'm sure dr bhavin jankaria in his next lecture will evaluate, uh, will tell you and and help you to understand how location helps him to come to a radiological diagnosis coming to symptology you need to understand a pain its nature how fast it is progressing and what type it is you need to evaluate the swelling in terms of its size site progression and number 
and you need to also look at the deformity by the tumor and which will give you a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis, whether you are dealing with a benign or a malignant tumor. In addition to that, if you are suspecting a malignant bone tumor, you also need to look at the symptoms and, uh, of a distant metastasis, lung being the most common site for distant uh, uh, metastasis from our primary malignant bone tumor. You need to assess the respiratory system very well. And often when tumors present late, patient can present with general cachexia as well. Clinical examination is extremely important. As I mentioned earlier, you need to look at the size, size and location of the swelling. You need to look at the margin and the border. You need to assess the mobility where it's arising from the soft tissue or the underlying bone. How many compartments have been involved by this disease? Whether a patient has undergone any previous surgery and there are any scars and drain sites because these are considered to be uh, taking, uh, contaminated by the tumor cells uh, by previous surgery, hence needs to be excised. You also need to look at lymph node uh, evaluation and distal neurovascular deficit. And once you have evaluated everything, you will clinically assess and try to say whether you can salvage this limb or not. So once you have done the clinical uh, history and clinical examination, you have a clinical diagnosis, whether it's a benign tumor or a malignant bone tumor or it's a metastatic bone disease or maybe a hematolymphoid disorder. Based upon that, we have some uh, blood uh, parameters uh, which can help you to clinch the diagnosis. Though benign malignant bone tumors and uh, uh, primary malignant bone tumors who do not have extreme specific markers, but there are very good tumor markers which can help you to differentiate them from metastatic bone disease. Alkaline phosphatase just being the very commonly raised in uh, anilytic bone lesions and can help you to differentiate uh, giant cell tumor from the Brown's tumor. And otherwise, as I mentioned here, we need to do a myeloma profile if you are, if you are suspecting uh, myeloma, which includes urinary Ben Jones protein and serum electrophoresis. If you are suspecting any primary and metastasis, then depending upon that, you need to uh, do the secondary uh, tumor markers as well. So once you have the uh, clinical diagnosis, we need to do appropriate imaging to establish it. And we have gamut of investigations available right from X-ray to PET scan. Imaging helps us in three ways. It helps us to clinch the diagnosis, which is the clinical radiological diagnosis. It helps us to assess the disease locally because you need to, uh, you, you want to do a surgery for this patient. And obviously you also need to assess the distance spread in case of malignant bone tumors. It helps in that as well. So in nutshell, in summary, we need to do X-ray and MRI for local staging and a CT scan of the chest and a bone scan to look at the distance spread in malignant bone tumors. Bone, similarly, your MRI must be scanning the entire bone, including the joints above and below, and it should be in all sequences. When you are talking about distance metastasis, we need to take help of CT scan of the chest, which can be a non-contrast CT scan, thin slices, and bone scan or PET scan. Evaluation of radiograph is extremely important and I think a, a, an orthopedic surgeon must know these four points which helps you to diagnose most of the lesion which includes the type of the lesion, zone of transition, periosteal reaction and the matrix produced by the tumor and Dr. Bhavani will elaborate more on this. MRI is the investigation of choice to assess the tumor locally as it tells you the exact extent of the disease intramedullary as well as in the soft tissues. It helps you to differentiate the neurovascular bundle and the joint involvement as well. As I mentioned earlier, CT scan is the investigation of choice to look at the lung metastasis and bone scan for the bony meds. PET scan is a new investigation which is evolving and, 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 and is becoming the investigation of choice for assessment of malignant bone tumors. At present, we always do PET scan for staging of Ewing sarcoma because it obviates the need of a invasive bone marrow biopsy in uh, in patients and in chondroid lesions is specifically helpful to differentiate between enchondromas from chondrosarcomas.
once you have your clinical radiological diagnosis after this assessment you need to confirm this clinical radiological diagnosis with the help of uh, biopsy and histopathology and it is must to do and just to show you one of the examples this is an extremely benign looking tumor in the distal uh, right femur you, there is no periosteal reaction there is no matrix it's reaching the subchondral bone in an adult mature skeleton even if it would have come to any uh, experienced surgeon he will consider it to be a giant cell tumor but definitely he will not go ahead with surgery and do appropriate imaging and biopsy but that didn't happen when this patient was operated at a peripheral center where uh, curettage and bone grafting was done and the samples were sent to tmh which came out to be a high grade spindle cell sarcoma and that's what an uh, you know very important lesson from my, my talk that irrespective how the imaging looks if you are planning any intervention any kind of treatment you must have a histopathological diagnosis before that biopsy is is uh, is a big topic in detail i'm not covering that i'm sure it will be covered later on but we need to understand that there are various questions about biopsy which we need to know and i think this uh, will be covered later on another very important point to understand is that you cannot uh you 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 must have a correct sequence for the evaluation you cannot do a biopsy up front and then try to take the history and do imaging okay so you need to do a uh, you need to take a detailed history based upon detailed history you will come to a clinical diagnosis once you know the clinical diagnosis based upon that you will order the appropriate imaging and then once you have a clinical radio radiological diagnosis you will perform a biopsy based upon the Uh, location of the lesion which you have assessed in the x-rays and the mris and hence it must be done in connection with uh, all these parameters once you have the diagnosis you must understand that you cannot initiate treatment unless and until you have evaluated the distant spread of the disease especially in malignant bone tumor and this is where staging comes into picture for gct we only do chest x-rays unless and until patient have other lesions where we can do bone scans for ewing sarcoma as i mentioned you the pet scan has become the investigation of choice and it obviates the need of the uh, invasive biopsies for uh, osteosarcoma you can do a pet scan or can do a ct scan of the chest and a bone scan so once we have this information we we need to stage our patients and there are two major staging system which are used aniking staging system which is pretty simple and easy to use another is ajcc system aniking who is the godfather of musculoskeletal oncology he gave the staging system who, who uh, and he talked about three stages in benign bone tumors as i uh, mentioned earlier and in malignant bone tumor he divided them into three stages all low grade tumor irrespective of uh, their size were in stage 1 if they were within the compartment that is within the bone they were uh, uh, type a and if they have gone outside the bone there is extra compartmental they were type b all high grade tumors like osteosarcomas and chondrosarcomas and differentiated sarcomas are considered in stage 2 uh, if they are within the bone there is the intra compartmental they are type 2a other if they have gone out type 2b and any metastasis whether bone or lungs was taken as type 3 easy to use and many surgeons still use this ajcc uh, system came a bit later on it's a bit uh, laborious but more precise which talks about the uh, primary site nodes and metastasis t1 lesions are less than 8 cm t2 lesions are more than 8 cm and you have if you have a skip you have t3 lesions and if you have bony metastasis it is considered as m1a if it is in the lung and it is m1b if it is any other site except the lung and this is how the grouping happens and based upon this grouping you can manage your treatment and why staging is important because any patient who comes to you is going to ask you what sort of treatment you going to offer to me and what will be my survival and these two questions are answered by staging and appropriate staging one last point which is very important that we need to understand that we surgeons alone cannot treat all bone tumors and we need to form a team we need to have a good team where we have support from the uh, musculoskeletal pathologist a good radiologist and so that we can come to a correct diagnosis 
once we have come to a correct diagnosis we need the help of various other uh, sub specialties which are involved in the management of bone tumors intervention radiology to treat many benign bone tumors as we are seeing in today's era and if you are dealing with malignant bone tumors you need help of your uh, medical oncology colleagues and radio uh, and radiotherapy colleagues because essentially all these tumors require a multi modality treatment thank you so much that was a quick glance on how you will evaluate a patient once uh, he has come with a suspected bone lesion in your clinic and i'll be happy to take if there are any questions am i audible yeah you are audible ashish i think uh, chetan has again got a bandwidth issue so uh, uh, how do we take the questions uh, are we getting any questions uh, can dr mutha uh, elaborate if we can have questions from the audience or this is supposed to go ahead as the program starts sir audience can drop the uh, questions on the chat box so that you can access it sir that's a point number okay. one or otherwise you can at the end of the session you can discuss the, either we You perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So we will then uh, move on because I don't see any questions yeah. in the yeah. chat box uh, as of now. So the next talk is going to be by Dr. Bhavin Jankaria, uh, who is the current president of the Indian Musculoskeletal Oncology Society, and he is going to cover on what a simple X-ray, uh, what all information an X-ray is going to give us. Uh, over to you, Dr. Jankaria. Hey, thanks, Yogesh. Thanks, uh, Chetan, if you're around, and uh, thank you the Uh, you know the entire team that's responsible for this i'll spend the next 15 18 minutes talking about x-rays you know i don't have flamingos near my house as ashish seems to have in his background so i'm actually putting my background off because i can't match what he is showing anyway so <laughs> let's um, talk about bone tumors um this is the list of benign tumors this is it and this is the list of malignant tumors one uh, two three four five and some rare ones and imagine that there are uh, all the faculty here spends or has spent their entire life dealing with about 25 tumors that's about it and you think whether that was worth the effort but um, let me tell you that it is an extremely rewarding uh, part of medicine uh, to be in so what do we use x rays for we use them to identify the lesion to differentiate uh, benign from aggressive characterize lesions based on location and uh, matrix give context to the mri and identify leave alone lesion so identifying the lesion is often very simple a patient comes with pain swelling some symptoms we uh take a radiograph and as she said these have to be typically ap and lateral should cover the entire bone joint above joint below here we see the osteoid osteoma and here we see um and i leave this uh, for you to think about as to what it might be but i'll address this in a minute but there there are times like this where we have a 15 year old boy this was his seventh <clears throat> or eighth radiograph all the others had been reported as normal um and he had 18 months history of pain in the right hip now whether this is hyposkelia uh, on the part of both the radiologists and the uh, people seeing him the orthopedic surgeons or whether truly this lesion was missed it's difficult to say but nevertheless there are situations where a diagnosis is not made or a lesion is not identified simply because we've lost the ability to pick it up and this eventually was an osteoid osteoma which was treated you can see that on the mr here and then of course we have situations like this where even retrospectively the radiograph is plumb normal so this is a patient who had a ewing sarcoma and even when we went back we couldn't see anything in the bone so that's as far as the x rays are concerned in most instances they would identify the lesion in some instances a trained eye with expertise is required and in some situations the x ray is plumb normal even when uh, the patient is symptomatic 
The next thing that the radiograph allows us to do is to differentiate benign from aggressive. And I use the term aggressive because often it's not possible to differentiate a malignant tumor from osteomyelitis, though in many instances we can. And we really just need two things to do. One is look at the zone of transition and look at the periosteal reaction. So the zone of transition is the transition point between the bone, um, the normal bone and the lesion. So when it is narrow, as we see here, that implies a benign lesion, as in this patient who has an ABC in the immature skeleton. Then it can be narrow with a sclerotic rim. <clears throat> now, when we have a sclerotic rim, it's all the more reason that this is benign. Um, and this was a cortex-based chondromyxoid fibroma. And then when the zone of transition is wide, that is, we can't see the difference between the normal and the abnormal bone, then we know it's aggressive. This is a Ewing sarcoma in an immature skeleton, but sometimes osteomyelitis can do the same. Then there are times when we have additional information. So here we do see a narrow zone of transition with a little bit of surrounding sclerosis, but then we see a beveled edge in this flat bone telling us this could likely be Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Now in a patient here like this, where we see a narrow zone, we also see this ill-defined diffuse sclerosis around that which is a sign of osteomyelitis, and in this case turned out to be tuberculosis. Now here is a patient who has a wide zone of transition, but in this case, the MR showed a collection which was aspirated. We also have some T1 fat sparing here, and that basically was uh, a bacterial osteomyelitis that was picked up. So that's as far as the zone of transition is concerned. Narrow means low or growth potential and wide means a uh, high growth potential and we take low growth potential to imply benign and high growth potential to imply malignant versus osteomyelitis. Periosteal reaction, if it's well-defined, thick, regular, then it's benign and here we see a narrow zone with a sclerotic rim in a cortical lesion, so this is osteofibrous dysplasia. And then when it is irregular, broken, the way we see it here in this osteosarcoma, then it tells us that it's aggressive. And then when we see an irregular periosteal reaction, but we're also seeing a Codman triangle, a sundry appearance, then we also know that it's an osteosarcoma. Here, there's also a wide zone of transition. And as we shall see later, there's osteoid or new bone formation, which tells us that it's a aggressive, malignant bone tumor with osteoid. Therefore, this becomes an osteosarcoma. Then we characterize these lesions based on location and matrix. Uh, let's first look at location. So location can be in the superior inferior plane, which means epi, epimetaphyseal, metaphyseal, diaphyseal, or location can be in the transverse plane where we have medullary, juxtamedullary, cortical, juxtacortical, et cetera. So we'll just, we need to know this. There is no way to kind of figure this out as we go along. Some of these things have to be mugged up and we have to know. So here is an epiphyseal lesion, sclerotic rim. So it has to be benign, immature skeleton. Therefore, this is a classic chondroblastoma. Epimetaphyseal reaching up to the articular surface in a mature skeleton without a sclerotic rim but a narrow zone. So benign lesion, mature skeleton, this is a classic giant cell tumor. Phalangeal lesion, narrow zone of transition, almost always this is an enchondroma. This is a cortical lesion with a sclerotic rim in the diaphysis. This in the immature skeleton is a fibrous cortical defect or a non-ossifying fibroma. Narrow zone of transition, humerus, immature skeleton, this becomes a simple bone cyst. Cortical lesion, sclerotic rim in an immature skeleton is chondromyxoid fibroma. Juxtacortical lesion, new bone formation, lots of osteoid, therefore becomes a parosteal OGS. So in the same way, we characterize lesions using matrix. And we've already seen a bunch of uh, lesions with the matrix. So we saw a couple of osteosarcomas and enchondroma. But let's look at it again. I'm seeing osteoid here in the spine, but with a narrow zone of transition. So benign lesion with osteoid would be osteoblastoma. 
Again, we have new bone formation, so that's osteoid, but this is an aggressive lesion, so wide zone of transition, irregular periosteal reaction, so aggressive lesion with osteoid becomes osteosarcoma. This is the cloudy appearance of cartilage, again, narrow zone of transition, phalangeal, so one of those rules, phalangeal lesions with cartilage are almost always benign um, and that holds true even if you were to see a wide zone of transition but this is a classic enchondroma this is a classic osteochondroma we don't have to describe it it has contiguity with the underlying marrow but let's look at this one rings and arcs appearance so that's cartilage irregular broken so likely aggressive aggressive cartilage tumor would therefore be a chondrosarcoma here we don't see a matrix. So when we see a matrix, it can be osteoid, chondroid, fibrous, et cetera, or a ground glass matrix, but you don't see a matrix, chances are that we're dealing with a cystic lesion. And we know this is a narrow zone. We know it's in the humerus. This is a simple bone cyst. Here we have a sclerotic rim. So we know it's benign. There's no way to say that it's an intraosseous lipoma. This diagnosis was made on MR, but we know that it's a benign lesion. Plus, this was an incidental finding on a knee MR for a, an ACL tear. And so it's really nothing to be done. But here we see that apart from the sclerotic rim, which tells us it's benign and it's in the femoral neck, which means it's literally just either a simple bone cyst or a fibrous dysplasia, we see ground glass, right? It's literally broken glass, which is ground together. And that matrix tells us for sure that we're dealing with fibrous dysplasia. Again, fibrous lesions have this typical appearance. So these are two non-ossifying fibromas on either side. And here we have mixed osteolysis and sclerosis. And this is a classic osteofibrous dysplasia, which produces bowing of the anterior cortex of the tibia. If you have an altered woven bone pattern, as in both these patients, this is characteristic of Paget, supposedly not common in India, but it is not uncommon. We see it in the elderly people. We weren't seeing it probably because people didn't live long enough. And we had this thing that it doesn't occur in India. So we were missing it, but it's there and we see it. Then we have the entire group of trabeculated expansile lesions where you have this um, trabeculated appearance. They almost always will have a narrow zone of transition. And this is a diaphysal lesion as an ABC. This is a pediatric giant cell tumor. And this does not reach the articular surface and was a desmoplastic fibroma. So whenever we see a trabeculated expansile lesion, your differential goes down to just these tumors, GCT, ABC, desmoplastic fibroma, osteofibrous dysplasia, and hemangioma. And here we see a pelvic lesion, immature skeleton, sharp sclerotic rim, narrow zone of transition. Classically, therefore, if it's one of these five in the immature skeleton, it would be an aneurysmal bone cyst. The next use of x-ray is giving context to the MR. So today, all patients with focal bone lesions will get an MR done. And we have this rule when I speak to radiologists that you never, ever report an MR without a radiograph. And I urge you as orthopedic surgeons not to keep the x-rays with you or you know, tell the patients to leave them at home. Tell the patients to take the x-rays with them. So here we see fluid levels which is typically seen in an aneurysmal bone cyst, which is what was reported by a very dear colleague of mine, who would have never reported that if the radiograph had been seen. Wide zone of transition, irregular periosteal reaction, so it's malignant, and osteoid. So this is osteosarcoma with fluid levels, so perhaps a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. So always, and even for y'all, when you see an MR, look at the radiograph and obviously the patient as well. Lastly, we use radiographs to tell us about these lesions, which if the patient is asymptomatic can be left alone and confidently, right? So non-ossifying fibroma usually picked up when we do knee MRs uh, for uh, sports injuries or an osteochondroma here, uh, unless the patient has pressure symptoms. Incidental pickup in a patient with plantar fasciitis, this could be either a simple bone cyst or an intraosseous lipoma, but the patient got imaged. See, today, 
the ability to confidently say that we can leave a patient alone or to characterize lesions on radiographs. Like I said, the hyposkelia affects the radiologists and the orthopedic surgeons. So even if it is a leave alone lesion, like a non-ossifying fibroma, an MR will be done because the parents often will say, Aapko 100% pata hai ki isme kuch nahi karna hai because they've also read up a lot. And so you will say, you know what, let's just get an MRI done, then we'll see. And then we hope that some radiologist somewhere puts it down in writing emphatically that nothing further needs to be done, right? So the reason um, we necessarily get MRIs done in almost all of these is because we don't have the confidence or sometimes the social situation dictates that we need to get more things done. So that's the role of the radiograph. It's still the primary modality as far as bone tumors um, are concerned. It is very important to be done unless you can't see the lesion at all. So it can identify the lesion. It helps us differentiate benign from aggressive relatively accurately and well. It allows us to characterize lesions based on location, epimetadia, and intramedullary, juxtamedullary, cortical, juxtacortical, and matrix, osteoid, chondroid, fibrous, uh, ground glass, etc. It obviously gives context to MR, and it allows us to identify leave alone lesions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful talk on basic radiology in bone tumors. I now invite Dr. Prakash Nai to deliver his talk on biopsy and diagnosis. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chetan Anchan, uh, the team from the Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society, uh, Dr. Ram Prabhu and Dr. Satish Muta for this opportunity. Uh, and so today I'm going to spend about 10 minutes now in trying to delve into some depths and some tips of how do we do biopsy of bone tumors and what sort of a checklist can we use in the clinic. Now I'm very cognizant that uh, I practice as a sarcoma surgeon at Tata Memorial Hospital. Uh, we have a big team with lots of help, but I'm very cognizant that my talk is geared towards imagining that I am the lone warrior practicing in my clinic where I need to take decisions on the core and know when to seek help, what sort of help, and how do I solve the problem that the patient presents for me. And it's very clear, this is an era where the bug of evidence-based medicine is biting everyone. And we must ask these questions, not just to physicians, but people in power, uh, and be very clear on when we are making a decision, we have a thought through plan of why we are making that call. Now, this is a picture uh, from a biopsy chapter that we wrote in the book that I've cited below uh, for copyright issues, uh, Atlas of Operative Surgical Oncology. And why I have put this up is because this is a young 32 year old male with a lesion in the proximal femur who was suspected to have tuberculosis, who had two large open biopsies, as you can see by the incisions. And unfortunately, as most and many of these stories end, he had a high-grade malignant tumor, which needed an external hemipelvectomy. Now, this is something that we need to guard against. So the first point that I want to drill to myself and all my colleagues is never to jump into doing an open biopsy for a suspected lesion, where I think that yes, based on the imaging, this lesion needs a biopsy. So point number one, to not jump into an open biopsy. Point number two is the biopsy, as has been elucidated very clearly by my prior speakers, Dr. Bhavin Jankaria and Ashish, is the confirmatory final step to the puzzle. It's not an initial step like doing a radiograph and doing the MR. We have to put everything into picture, the clinical paradigms, all the findings that we get on the radiograph, all the details that we have on the MRI have a very clear list of differentials. Ask ourselves, does this need a biopsy? Should I be doing the biopsy? And what do I suspect when I do the biopsy? Because it will help me guide not just the location and the technique of doing the biopsy, but what is the kind of material that I expect and what is the kind of differential on my list 
to help me make sense of the pathology reports that I get. Another crucial point, oftentimes when we do a biopsy, not just that we not do an open biopsy, but never place drains away from the incision that I'm taking. Never ever. Even in the occasional instance where an error has happened, where you might have done an open biopsy, considering it's an osteomyelitis or a tuberculous joint, where you have done a debridement or where I have done a debridement, it always makes prudent sense to back out by having the drain in line. But first of all, to never fall in a situation where we first do an open biopsy and place drains on either sides far away from the lesion. This is a big no. So what do I need? In 95 or close to 100% of the times in today's era, we must resort to the humble, simple Jamshidi needle for all our biopsies. This is all we shall need, simple equipment, a stab knife, local anesthesia, 15 minutes of procedure. But a lot of thought has to go into planning this procedure and I will take you through these details. We've always heard of why do a needle biopsy? Do it in the line of the incision because eventually when we do resect, we resect a little skin where enclosure becomes easier and it does not come in the way of the eventual salvage that might be needed in the worst case scenario, which is a malignant sarcoma of the bone. So the question that you must ask yourself and I ask myself in the clinic every time I have a bone lesion is to needle or not to needle. Step number one, do I have the correct and adequate imaging? We oftentimes have an ultrasound report which says, well, I think this is a lesion in the bone done for a suspected abscess and we jump into a decision to do a biopsy based on that ultrasound report, no. We must have adequate correct imaging before we take that plunge. Question number two, Dr. Bhavin Jankarya has very nicely detailed on leave me alone or touch me not lesions. We must ask ourselves, is this lesion the actual cause of the patient's symptoms? If we see an asymptomatic enchondroma or an asymptomatic non-ossifying fibroma or an asymptomatic intraosseous lipoma, I must step back and say, just because I see a lesion, I'm not going to biopsy it. The lesion must deserve its biopsy, which is why it must be a symptomatic lesion, which I corroborate with the site and the nature of the lesion I see on the imaging. And then as Ashish elucidated, ask myself, is this a tumor? Is this infection? Is this metabolic? And before we treat any lesion, before we plan to operate any lesion, biopsy, 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 because it's a confirmatory step. If we have a big lesion, that's very obvious with a large solid component based on all the imaging that you've done, you'll ask yourself, well, is it okay if I biopsy this in the clinic with the help of a CM? Absolutely, yes. But nine out of 10 times, we must think, do I need a radiologist's help to help me target the lesion better using an ultrasound or a CT scan? And if the answer is maybe or yes, we must lean towards minimizing errors. We must lean towards taking the help of our radiology colleagues in getting image-guided biopsies. In the occasional cases where we have a big mass, a lot of solid component, a very obviously targetable lesion, yes, CM guided biopsies under local anesthesia right in your clinic is feasible, but a lot of thought must go into it. And if there's any doubt, if I'm doing it for the first time, or if there's a big cystic component in the lesion, which I'm unable to target, I must resort to using image guidance. The adequacy of the imaging is what will help me target the line of the biopsy, the line of the eventual incision. A basic dictum that I'd like to follow and I'd encourage all my colleagues to follow is imagine the worst. When I'm doing the biopsy, I must imagine this is going to be a sarcoma. If I take all these steps that are necessary, assuming that I'm going to biopsy a bone sarcoma, one will never go wrong. One will place the needle at the right point. One will look at the imaging in the right way, take the right amount of course, and never err while we deal with these lesions. So prepare for the worst, assume the worst, 
plan for the worst and then perform your biopsy. An extremely important point that I want to make. This is a young 15 year old boy who presented with a fall and a fracture and had an intramedullary nailing done pretty close by in the city. Now, when they came to TMH and I asked the parents that how did he fall? They didn't comment on any statement. They didn't explain. They just showed me a video that they could capture from his building when they were playing in the evening. It's extremely important. I wanted to focus on their coming. So these are three kids running. The kid stops. There's a kid who will come back and there he goes, right? He falls there and breaks his bone. Now a 15 year old boy having a fracture like this is not a traumatic fracture. Uh, the message here is it's extremely crucial to go into the history. If there is anything like this, it's very clearly a pathologic fracture, which must not be uh, treated as a regular post-traumatic fracture, where treating the fracture is not an emergency, and we must treat and biopsy it. So how should I do it? Should I do a guided biopsy? Where to place the needle? How many cores? Where do I send it? In what medium do I send it? And the basic dictum of think about culture what you biopsy, biopsy what you culture. So how should I do it? The answer is with a needle. Should I do a guided biopsy? The imaging will tell you that. And when in doubt, do a guided biopsy. I'll come to quick details of where to place the needle and quick details of how many cores, at least a minimum of five to seven cores, five to seven good cores. And this is important that you separate the cores for pathology and separate the cores for culture. It's also very important that we send all the cores to one reliable lab to not split them into multiple labs. And why seven cores? Because oftentimes today we need immunohistochemistry markers, we may need molecular genetic tests, and we need adequate cores for all these samples. At the back of your mind, if you suspect infection based on the imaging, always or on the side of taking separate sample for culturing, if need be for gene export. A reminder, all samples to one lab, adequate cores, and for me, it's a median of five to seven cores and separate cores for culture or gene export. This is one of the many articles that we have stuck in the radiology suite and in the biopsy OR, which helps us plan how are we going to do the biopsy. This is by a dream of radiologists where there are specific cross-sectional imaging used to know where do we place the needle. Before we go to that, a simple example, again from the uh, chapter that we wrote for biopsies on the line of incision. Now I'd be happy to share this uh, slide and also this chapter. Now this is very crucial. There are very standard straight incisions on the extremity bones. The top left is on the femur, the bottom left is on the, uh, sorry, the top left is for the trochanteric lesions. The bottom left is for diaphyseal and distal femoral lesions. The top right is for lesions on the leg. And the bottom right is for lesions on the arm. These are simple longitudinal uh, incisions, which are placed on the likely future excisions, assuming this were a sarcoma. And our goal is to place a biopsy site along the line of this incision at the most suitable spot with the basic goal of not crossing compartments and remembering to not injure any neurovascular bundle and to stay far away from the joint. A quick four images before I end my talk. This is the proximal femur. This is the imaging from the article that I just showed which tells us the green is the corridor, the safe corridor. And if you look at the bottom right image, we have avoided the TFL, we have avoided the vastus lateralis, and we have gone at the edge of the septum. Now, the key here is to go through one compartment, to not cross multiple compartments, to be as far away from the neurovascular bundle that, that's marked in red. And this is where we will place our biopsy in line with the incision I showed you a slide ago for the proximal femoral lesions. And similarly, for the femoral lesions, we must go either medial or lateral close to the septum. And what I mean by that is we must place it posterior laterally 
above the IT band. I like to palpate the IT band and just above or through the anterior half through the posterior lateral septum so that our needle is placed along the posterior edge of the vastus lateralis or the vastus medialis so the hematoma is contained in one compartment and that's how we target our biopsies. Very important to stay away from the rectus, away from the suprapatellar pouch, away from the knee joint. You proceed with the tibia. The medial tibia is fairly straightforward. It's a subcutaneous bone. When it comes to the anterolateral tibia, we will place it through the edge of the tibialis anterior muscle. And when it comes to fibula, the only key elements to avoid is the common peroneal nerve. And these uh, images, if you stick them in your clinic, it will be very simple because these are along various cross sections and will help us precisely guide our biopsy tracks. I have already dealt with the proximal arm lesions where we must not, must not go into the deltopectoral groove. We must target the anterior deltoid. And clinically, what I like to do is the arm straight, palpate the acromion, draw straight line, four finger spaces below, it will be the anterior deltoid to avoid the deltopectoral groove. This is again for the forearm, where we have to place it either through the mobile ward when it comes to the radius or in the ulna through a subcutaneous bone. And it's oftentimes in the arm and in the forearm where image guidance is extremely crucial. One key point for cystic lesions is to scrape the walls because oftentimes they will be posse cellular. You will not have adequate solid component, scrape the walls. And if I'm short of time, I will not go through the video and maybe we'll come to that later on in the panel. This is the simple set of equipments that we need, local anesthesia, a stab knife, a simple vati with some saline and a jamshiri needle, either gauge 12 or gauge 14. These are the usual steps. You localize under the C-arm, infiltrate local anesthesia, get the needle and get adequate course. I think I'm overshooting time. So Jaden, you can stop me anytime. I'll not go through the video and maybe we can come back to that later. How long is the video? About uh, a minute. Yeah, then please show it. It will be useful for, you know. So this is an old video. Yeah, this is an old video. I'm sure um, uh, Dr. Agarwal and, and Dr. Puri would remember. Um, and I've kept this because it has crucial points uh, that uh, we deal with. Needle biopsy, particularly when we are doing um, biopsy of the bone, it's important to infiltrate the periosteum. Oh, that's a classic a bone biopsy needle, the Jamshiri uh, needle or a trefine needle, which we often use for bone marrow biopsies can also be used. The trocar, a sharp trocar is extremely important to gain entry after which the trocar is removed because it will lead to crush artifacts. We make smooth circular motions to trap the core. Once we are sure we're inside the bone, we place a gauze piece as soon as we exit to prevent any hematoma and you can ask your assistant to do it. And we use the stillet and not the trocar to get the core out into normal saline. Now, oftentimes what I like to do is separate a lot of clots that have, that have come by. And these are at least three to five to seven cores uh, which are the size of your phalanx. Uh, and that's how you would do a biopsy. It's important oftentimes if it's a vascular lesion, you may get a lot of blood and you can take it in saline, separate off the clots uh, and identify good cores and send them to your pathologist in one sample. Thank you so much for your attention. And I hope to take any questions right now or later. Uh, thank you so much, Prakash. I think we will keep the questions for later. Uh, I invite now Dr. Yogesh uh, Panjpak to deliver his talk on soft tissue tumors. This is a new topic that I have introduced because I have seen enough number of these uh, tumors being violated and patients really ending up in big trouble. Yogesh. Yeah, thank you Please. very much, uh, Chetan. Thanks for the invitation and greetings from IMSOS, that is the Indian Musculoskeletal Oncology Society, uh, to all the members of MSOS, as I understand, that's the Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society. And uh, kudos to Chetan for, uh, you know, touching upon this particular topic, because this is something that we were discussing yesterday that uh, typically the clinicians tend to underestimate. And that's the reason why uh, it may lead to a lot of trouble for you as a surgeon, as well as the 
patient and family. Uh, let me share this example of a 72 years old uh, government officer with you. He presented to an orthopedic colleague of ours with a soft tissue swelling in the anterolateral aspect of the uh, lower leg. Uh, the history was of two to three years duration and the mass had been progressively increasing since the last few months. Uh, typically, uh, though he was imaged, the surgeon thought that it was a, a lipoma for some reason, did not get a biopsy done as Prakash had mentioned that it is so vital to get a histopathological diagnosis done on these particular tissues. And he was posted for an into inverted commas, an excision via lipoma. So obviously the treating team thought that it was a lipoma. He was treated and possibly they ended up doing an incomplete job, an interlesional surgery. You can see the wide hash marks and inappropriately placed drain. And this later on turned out to be a high grade soft tissue sarcoma. Now for the patients, this is going to be a, a very problematic situation as well as they are treating on orthopedic oncosurgeon at a later date. Uh, why do we call soft tissue sarcomas as a killer on the loose? Because most of them are misunderstood or underestimated by our colleagues as sometimes ganglions, sometimes as hematomas, sometimes as uh, uh, calcifying hematomas. And most of the times uh, they go in and they realize later on that a mistake has been done, what we call as a hoops uh, surgery. Uh, proper surgery for these lesions is the mainstay of treatment if you want to achieve cure in these cases. These particular tumors are unforgiving. Uh, any amount of chemotherapy or radiation added later on to an inappropriately done surgery is not going to be helpful for these particular patients. And invariably, they have good or very high chances of local recurrence and metastatic disease, and they would lose their lives if these are not dealt with very, very carefully. And that's why we call soft sarcomas as are treated without an adequate biopsy uh, preoperatively. And this leads to a higher intralesional margins in, during the surgery. It leads to an increased morbid procedure at a later date. We may have to involve our plastic surgeons to do a flap, or we may end up doing an amputation for these particular patients. And typically, these patients are referred to the appropriate sarcoma center pretty late. Uh, more than 50% of these patients who are inappropriately treated to begin with, they have a residual tumor when we re-excise the entire mass and send it for pathological examination. Well, what happens when this is the case? The patient has a higher risk of recurrence with higher grade and a residual disease that has been left behind. And the risk of metastasis is almost about three times higher when an inappropriate surgery is done. And hence, we need to remember that these particular soft tissue sarcomas have to be dealt by a proper team. They have to be worked up properly and treated pro properly. Now, these are tumors which arise primarily from the mesenchymal tissue, and some of them may arise from the neuroectoderm. Uh, they are very heterogeneous group of malignancies, and typically the most differentiated tumor cell type on the biopsy will decide what specific tissue uh, classification they belong to. Uh, there are a lot and lot of tumors, but just to mention it briefly that any tissue in the body can give rise to a soft tissue sarcoma. The fat, the fibroblastic tissue, the fibrohistocytic tissue, the smooth muscle, the skeletal muscle, the vascular tissue, chondroosseous tissue, anything can give rise to a soft tissue sarcoma. And then there are tumors of a certain differentiation, which are probably more common, like the synovial sarcomas or the epithelioid sarcomas uh, and others. Uh, these are extremely rare, and that's the reason why they are actually misunderstood for hematomas and lipomas and uh, ganglion cysts. There are only one to three lakh per, uh, per, per uh, one to three cases per lakh population per year in Indian population. Uh, typically, they may occur at any age. Uh, usually, they have a certain distribution, like the younger generation have more incidence of a rhabdomyosarcoma. Middle-aged patients will have more cases of liposarcomas and the older uh, patients may have malignant fibrous histiocytomas. But any of these can occur at any age and there's no strict rule that they, they uh, follow. Now, the presentation of these particular soft tissue sarcomas can be multifold. Uh, it can present to you as an incidental finding of a lump which has been growing since a few days. Uh, sometimes it may present as an, a whoops procedure, as I mentioned earlier, some lump was excised, uh, thinking it to be benign and it turned out to be a sarcomatous lesion at, on pathology. It may present as a local recurrence of a previously excised soft tissue sarcoma, or sometimes we do see patients who have come to us very late and they have very massive and complicated tumors. 
So uh, let's let's see each one of them uh, turn by turn. Typically, uh, the virgin tumor, as I call them, the, the tumors which present to us per primum, they have an insidious onset as a small painless lump. And after a few months, they suddenly start growing uh, rapidly in size. Uh, they are typically painless to begin with, and that's the reason they are uh, ignored. A pain in a soft tissue sarcoma is typically because of compression of the surrounding structures or maybe intratumoral uh, infarction or, humor, uh, or hemorrhage. The problem is that most of these are very commonly located in the proximal part of uh, the thigh and the pelvis, and hence they can be very easily missed unle uh, until they become very large in size. Uh, in the upper limb, probably they are more easily uh, recognized. More than 50% of the soft tissue sarcomas, they lie beneath the deep fascia. They typically show centrifugal growth as all the sarcomas show, typically will respect the anatomic boundaries, and unless and until it is very, very late, they will rarely invade through the anatomical so the term to follow is that any tumor or of size more than three centimeters, which is found deep to the deep fascia should be regarded as a soft tissue sarcoma, unless and until it is proven to be otherwise, because that's the only way to increase our uh, suspicion, to have an early detection and to avoid wrong interventions, which will cause uh, damage to the patient's management at a later date. What about the whoops procedure? You know, these are the cases where someone has excised it, assuming to be benign, and it turns out to be a sarcoma. It poses many challenges for the treating team. The margins are typically unacceptable oncologically, or they are compromised. There could have been a lot of spillage with hematoma formation, which leads to contamination of the field. And typically, these patients may need very large uh, plastic flaps, sometimes free flaps, or sometimes a full oncological clearance may also necessitate amputation at an appropriate level in most of the patients. Sometimes they present recurrent masses uh, uh, which are in the tumor bed which have been operated earlier by someone else. These are typically because of compromised margins because these particular sarcomas may have satellite nodules and if you don't do an adequate excision with the surrounding good normal cuff of tissue left behind as margin, they will recur. Uh, the treatment typically will be same as what we do for the primary and I'll be touching upon that uh, just in a while. And then there are certain patients uh, uh, who will be presenting extremely uh, late because of various le uh, reasons. It could be cultural, socioeconomic reasons, psychological or illiteracy that may be responsible for this. And this typically would uh, make the treatment even more complicated or it may just uh, prevent a limb salvage surgery or limb salvage surgery may have to be done with a lot of morbidity. So workup of soft tissue sarcomas is something akin to uh, that of uh, a bone sarcoma that Ashish touched upon a little while ago. And here as well, we need to have a proper imaging before uh, we decide to do any type of treatment. A plain radiograph is not as much contributory as it is in a bone sarcoma. But typically, there are a few lesions like the synovial sarcoma, which give rise to a lot of calcification. And this particular calcification seen on the X-ray or the CT scans may give us an idea of the aggressiveness of the disease. MRI scan stands uh, is one of the most important investigations that we need to do in these particular lesions for obvious reasons that it gives us an idea about the extent, the intramedullary involvement, if any, involvement of the neurovascular bundle, and it just helps us in planning the biopsy and then planning the surgery at a later date. CT scan, typically, uh, local CT scan is of not much use, except that it gives you a very good idea about the intratumor calcification, if any. Uh, CT chest is used for staging purposes, and PET CT sometimes is uh, used for staging as well as to plan uh, a biopsy. Uh, Prakash has very nicely uh, talked to us about what should be the correct biopsy procedure. And uh, like he has shown uh, a J needle biopsy technique for the bone sarcomas, we typically use these true cut biopsy guns for uh, the soft tissue masses because J needle is not going to be uh, giving us the adequate tissue or the appropriate tissue the way it gives us in, in a bone sarcoma. So these are the various types of guns, as we call them, that we use for uh, uh, doing a biopsy. The principles of approach remains, uh, remain exactly the same as Prakash has pointed out. So I'm not going to elaborate on that. Uh, Ashish mentioned about the Enneking's uh, concept, uh, the classification. The margin concept of Enneking applies to soft tissue tumors also. And in the soft tissue sarcomas, what we do is 
a wide excision as is shown over here that we don't remove the tumor just by uh, its capsule or we don't enucleate it, but we have to remove it by keeping a good cuff of normal tissue, normal skin and normal muscle around it so as to reduce the chances of local recurrence and to ensure that all the satellite nodules have been taken out. Uh, surgery remains the mainstay. As I said, the aim is to obtain oncologically sound margins, remove the tumor completely. And if it can be done while maintaining a good functional outcome in the extremity, then limb salvage surgery is to be considered. But we should never compromise disease clearance while attempting, attempting to save the function or to save the extremity. Uh, sometimes when the neurovascular bundle is very close, we may decide to leave the vascular sheath back onto the tumor have a very close margin over there and then supplement it with an external radiotherapy. So that's a very typical uh, case of a synovial sarcoma, which was intervened thinking as a lipoma. You can see the scar of previous surgery, a smaller tissue, pretty straightforward excision as is seen over here. And you don't see the tumor at the time of excision. It has been removed with a good amount of uh, the skin and the subcute tissue and the muscle that is left around as an adequate margin. And this is what is required to be done for an appropriate treatment. As I was mentioning, uh, mentioning earlier, sometimes the neurovascular bundle may be very close, may be trapped in a groove of the tumor. And here we leave the vascular sheath onto the tumor and then supplement it with external radiotherapy. Radiation postoperatively is extremely important to give us or to increase the margins to reduce the chances of local recurrence. And nowadays we have good techniques, radiotherapy techniques, which will reduce the side effects or reduce the scatter of radiation to the surrounding uh, vital organs. So typically the dose ranges between 50 to 65 grays and can be used preoperatively or postoperatively. Preoperative radiation sometimes in soft tissue sarcomas can has to be used if you want to sort of downstage the tumor or make the excision easier in very large tumors, but has very large or very high uh, wound healing complication rate, especially in proximal thighs. Post-op radiotherapy remains the mainstay of treatment along with surgery, and that is typically what is used. Some One other technique uh, that can be employed is what we call as a brachytherapy, where after excision of the soft tissue sarcoma, we you know, the radiation oncologist implants these particular catheters in the wound bed, then we do the closure, and then radiation is given through this particular uh, 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 brachytherapy machine. Typically, it reduces the overall time of the, uh, of the radiotherapy treatment postoperatively, and the delivery of the radiation is specifically to the tumor bed, again, uh, reducing the complications of external radiation. The role of chemotherapy is uh, pretty limited in soft tissue sarcomas, and hence we have to be very careful with the surgical excisions. It is a bit controversial also. Uh, there are only a few tumors which are chemosensitive, like the rhabdomyosarcomas or the soft tissue having uh, sarcomas, or sometimes some cases of synovial sarcomas and myxoid uh, or round cell liposarcomas. These are the only cases, typically the large ones, or in metastatic settings, where we will typically decide about using chemotherapy. Otherwise, that's not the choice of treatment that we would use. Uh, local recurrences are seen in about less than 15% of cases of soft tissue sarcomas when they are adequately treated. Uh, and the management will also depend upon the type of presentation of local recurrence that we get in these particular cases. Metastasis are quite high, up to the tune of about 40 to 50%. If uh, they are only pulmonary, uh, if surgery is feasible, then we do attempt to do a pulmonary metastatectomy. Uh, certain soft tissue sarcomas have predilection towards lymph node metastasis, and these are the synovial sarcomas, epithelial sarcomas, and rhabdomyosarcomas. And sarcomas. And we need to be careful to assess the regional lymph nodes uh, to see whether there are any metastasis in these particular areas. And typically, uh, if the disease-free survival is higher, if the metastasis are smaller in size or less in number, like less, in, less than four, and we are able to remove them completely, then these particular patients do have a chance of cure even after having metastatic spray. So to summarize, you need to have a high index of suspicion while treating these particular uh, lumps and bumps in the soft tissue. Do not assume that they are benign unless and until they are proven by biopsy. Whoops increases the morbidity and compromises the overall outcome in these particular patients. Follow the basic workup and management guidelines in soft tissue sarcomas as well. And as far as possible, involve the sarcoma centers and the sarcoma specialists and the multidisciplinary teams who are treating these particular tumors to have the best possible outcome in your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yogesh, uh, for
covering this uh, subject so well. Soft tissue sarcomas are indeed uh, killers on the loose, and if we don't manage them well, we see you know, the consequences of that. Now I invite uh, Dr. Mandeep Shah to present another you know common problem which is often mismanaged that is pathological practice. Mandeep. Hi, Chetan. Uh, am I hi, audible? Hi. I am. Am I audible? You're audible. Yes. So yes I'll yes. keep my video off because You'll my internet share is giving me problem. I I'm no keep no video off because my internet is giving me problems yeah. since morning. So I'll I'll keep mm -hmm. my video. Sure, sure. 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 All sure, right. Sure. You can share your screen. Yeah, I'm doing that. Thank you. Uh, M. Sauce and Chetan in particular for having me here. And uh, the session has been really wonderful since morning, very informative even for us. So I have been given the responsibility of talking about pathological fractures. So this is a broken distal femur. And I'll show you another few examples of broken distal femurs. So these are also broken distal femurs, you know, but there is obviously a lesion there. These are some more, you know, you can see a destructive lesion in the distal end of femur and that has led to the breakage of the bone. These are some more, you know, where you can see a nice lesion which has uh, uh, made the bone weaker and that is what has led to the fracture. And these are some more, you know, these are all not the same. You know, the first x-ray is obviously different from the rest of the x-rays. So what is the difference? This is a simple traumatic fracture. You don't see any destruction of the bone, but probably the trauma was so bad that the bone got broken. But these are pathological fractures and these are because of benign tumors. You know, these are the, this is GCT, this is GCT, this is aneurysmal bone cyst. And these are the primary malignancies, which has led to the pathological fracture. These are all the X-rays because of metastatic bone lesions where the metastasis has damaged the bone coming from somewhere else. And these are osteomyelitis, osteoporotic, and metabolic bone diseases, which, are, which have caused pathological fractures. So basically, you know, what happens when these fractures, which are not the simple broken bones, they are treated just like another broken bone. So let us see a few cases, you know. So this is a 16-year-old girl who had pain in the thigh since 15 days, and she broke the bone while, while playing. And this is what was done. The surgeon obviously thought that there is a lesion so that you can see a window here, you know, which uh, where he has tried to do some sort of curettage or taking out some tissue from inside. And he has done also the nailing. Probably it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, a laying done to the joint. It's an IMSC. So he has contaminated the joint while he is putting this nail. And this was actually an osteogenic sarcoma when the patient presented to the orthopedic oncologist. She had very large mass and multiple lung metastasis. This is another boy who, had, who was 19 years of age. He had pain in the thigh since three months. Now he had a fall from bike and he has fractured this bone. The surgeon did realize that there is something going on here. I mean, the, the bony ends are very, very rarefied. They are, it looks like there was a lesion there. So he sends the patient for an MRI. The radiologist reports this as probably a pathological fracture through the pre-existing simple bone cyst. He takes a diagnosis, he does an interlocking nailing, he sends the remaining material for histopathology examination, which was obviously reported as negative for any tumor. And this is how the patient presented to us three months later, where it was reported as osteogenic sarcoma. This patient had to undergo a total femur replacement. Fortunately, the patient is doing well. So what are the issues from these two cases? What do we learn? You know, a careful history taking was not done. The significant history of pre-trauma pain was ignored. A lesion was identified by surgeon in both the cases, but it was not properly investigated. The time was wasted as the diagnosis got delayed. In both the cases, entire canal got contaminated. So instead of a probable joint spreading uh, or, in, uh, or intercalary resection, a total femur resection had to be done in the second case. The first case never came up for a curative surgery. It would have morbid surgery with lifelong consequences. There would be a soft, soft tissue contamination and that which increases the chances of local recurrence. And we now know that rimming of the canal uh, when there is a sarcoma inside, it disseminates or showers the tumor cells into the circulation, leading to increased chances of metastasis. 
Let us see another few interesting cases. This is a 53 year old female. She had pain in the groin since three months. Now she fractures the bone while changing the position during the sleep at night. Now this is such an important history. The patient herself is giving the surgeon. But what the surgeon do? He does bipolar, bipolar hemiarthroplasty and he doesn't even send the head for histopathological examination. The pain is now the patient has difficulty in walking. The X did show lysis in the trochanter. So the surgeon thought that probably she is developing infection and that she is put on antibiotics. At five months postoperatively, the pain increases. So he does a debridement, sends the tissue for culture, but it still doesn't send the tissue for histopathological examination. The cultures obviously were negative, and he was she was suggested observation. But the pain increased. She was now unable to walk. There was a large swelling and she developed a large DVT at nine months post-op when she presented to us. We did a biopsy and it was actually a high-grade osteosarcoma. This is how the patient presented to us. So now it, she was twice contaminated. The joint was contaminated. The canal probably was reamed. The whole canal was reamed because a bipolar prosthesis was put in. There was a soft tissue spillage. There was, there was a multinodular recurrence. There were large, two large incisions and the drain site was far away. As you can see here, the drain site was far away. This was the first, second drain, this was the first drain. So the obvious choice for this patient was to go for a hindquarter amputation. Forget about even a disarticulation because even the estabular cavity is now contaminated. This is another patient who had a giant cell tumor. She had a pathological fracture and the the, the patient underwent curettage, cementation, and a stainless steel implant was put in. That patient developed a local recurrence, a large local recurrence, and this is how she presented to us. What we realized was that she was even given post-operative radiotherapy. There was no prior histopathological review available. The implants were stainless steel, so even imaging was very difficult for us. And look at this funny incision, how the first surgery was carried on. This is a young three-year-old girl who had a distal radius aneurysmal bones with a buckling fracture. What the surgeon does, he does a curettage, harvests the fibula from the, uh, uh, from the leg. He puts that thing as a graft. The disease heals, but it also causes a growth arrest, as you can see here. So what are the issues? We, he didn't know that today we are treating the aneurysmal bones with simple sclerotherapy. So there was a lack of recent knowledge. He didn't know that sclerotherapy probably exists and is successful in almost 85% of cases. Because of that, the poor, poor kid had to undergo surgery at two sites and entire surgery and disability could have been avoided if he had known that these days, adenosine bones can be successfully treated without surgery. This is a 35-year-old female who had a tibial fracture through a light lesion. He does nailing, curate touch, and bone grafting, sends the material for histopathology, and the pathologist is reported this as giant cell reparative granuloma. Well, he ignores or he didn't really, uh, you know, do any sort of uh, more, given it more, more thought, you know, what is a giant cell reparative granuloma. After a few months, she develops a femur fracture. He does nailing again. And then the patient is put on periparatide, calcium supplements, etc., etc. After a while, she has this swelling in the thumb where he does a curettage and bone grafting. And she undergoes five surgeries for various bone lesions over five years. And she's bedridden for almost three years. Now, because she developed lesion in the sacrum with ball bladder issue, she is now sent to an orthopedic oncologist. Had he known that giant cell reparative granuloma is, uh, is actually uh, you know, a diagnosis of brown tumor, he, would have just, he should have just done a PTH, calcium and phosphorus and alkaline phosphorus analysis and done a sonography of uh, of neck to find out a nice uh, parathyroid adenoma, these four surgeries could have been avoided. So all this patient needed was you know, removal of this parathyroid adenoma and that could have probably cured this patient, which took her five years of misery. So the rarity of disease led to a low index of suspicion. At least four of these five surgeries could have been avoided if the histopathological review was, uh, histopathological report was understood by the surgeon and further workup was done. The systemic repercussion of chronic hypercalcemia could have been avoided and five precious years of patients were lost in bed and agony that could have been easily avoided. This is a 35-year-old female. She had a pain in the hip since one month. 
she visits a surgeon surgeon gives her medicines she develops fractures while bathing now surgeon could see the lesion so he knew that this is clearly a pathological fracture he gets an mri done mri is also showing uh, you know the pathology existing in the head and neck of femur with an with a uh, with a full displaced fracture unfortunately the report report of this this uh, mri doesn't mention pathology that it's a pathological fracture it probably misses that part that it's not a it's a pathological fracture so the surgeon is very happy that okay this is not a pathological fracture so he does a nice total hip replacement he sends this head for the histopathological examination it re, it says that it's a representative biopsy but it's just a necrotic bone and marrow and there is no granuloma or there is no malignancy this is how the patient presented to us after after 3 months and there was clearly uh, an ongoing process that tumor had now become very big we reviewed the same pathology by a more experienced msk pathology surgeon pathologist and it was reported as high grade is high grade osteogenic sarcoma unfortunately on pet ct scan she had by now multiple bone and lung metastasis and she could not really be, be qualified for a curative management so here the inexperience of surgeon radiologist and pathologist costed the patient her life surgeon couldn't think beyond it being assist radiologist didn't say see any lesion and pathologist couldn't find any pathology now that was really weird couple of more cases this is 60 year old farmer presents with pain in the upper thigh post trivial trauma it was presumed to be a metastatic lesion because patient is 60 years old a nailing was done which was actually unfortunately it was a primary sarcoma is another lady who is actually a known case of breast cancer now she develops this pathological fracture the surgeon does a ds dcs fixation and this actually was a malignant fibrous histiocytoma of bone and she had to undergo this kind of a massive surgery so we should not assume that uh, because just because the patient is of old age the fracture which has happened in her or him is a pathological fracture because we also know that second primaries they exist and they are not very uncommon so what do all these cases tell us what are the learning points the learning point is that someone else is paying very heavily for your mistakes or misdeeds you know you should think twice before you do any anything like that and we also know that just like men will be men the orthopedic surgeons will also be orthopedic surgeons you know you know these are the cases which makes people talk about orthopedic surgeons as thick skinned people you know they always make a joke of orthopedic surgeons that while they are training only thing which hypertrophy is their muscle and in fact the brain atrophies because we all have this deadly oculobrachial reflex the moment we see a patient who has a pathological or any sort of fracture we kind of you know think of only surgery only surgery and our forearm muscles starts getting twitched and you know they are they are getting active you know just to hold a knife the real problem as yogesh said is that we assume too much assumption is the mother of all goof ups we assume too much and we assume too much about those diseases which we know very little of no so pathological fracture is not an emergency pathological fracture is not an emergency and workup is absolutely mandatory you know but why workup is mandatory the workup is mandatory because treatment of of any bone tumor is oncology first and orthopedic next you know we are all orthopedic surgeons first but whenever we are treating pathological fracture we have to think like an oncologist because we have to decide the intent of treatment so what is the intent of treatment when we are treating benign tumors we want to do a more function preserving surgery that means we want to take out the tumor but we want to also preserve the function as much as possible so that way we will be doing a more a uh, conservative intralesional surgery we will try to save the joint so that the patient has a good functional range at the end of the treatment here we are risking a small chance of local recurrence but we are giving or preserving the patient for functional but when we are treating a primary malignancy our aim is to cure the patient for cancer the aim is life preservation and that is when what we will be doing this is a patient of pathological fracture through a because of an evening sarcoma proximal humerus what will be doing will be doing a wide excision as my previous speakers have already said we will be we, we will be uh, you know uh, sacrificing the shoulder joint function for the rest of the life or preserving the life 
but when we are treating a metastatic tumor our intent is palliation that means we want we know that the patient may not survive we want to improve quality of life and that is where we will be either doing a marginal or an interregional excision of the tumor but we will do a reconstruction which will allow early and full ambulation or full function to the patient like in this patient you know so you know every day of this patient's life is precious and we don't want them to spend any day in the life of their life in the bed or in pain so the lessons that we have learned from all these cases is that bone tumors are rare in experience pathologist may not diagnose the condition correctly please send the biopsy sample to a specialist in experience surgeon only complicate the matter for a patient remember it is not about anybody's surgical skills good surgeons know how to operate better surgeons know when to operate and the best surgeons know when not to operate and do not treat tumors casually your patient's limb and life depend on it and remember a failed trauma surgery what will happen it might just cause non linear or ma or malunion a failed arthroscopy may lead to a tear you can still rectify the problem a failed tear you can do a fusion but a failed onco surgery most of these patients would not even survive so we have to control the surgical itch you know if not about our conscience you should be we should be at least scared of the laws because you know medical negligence it's just that you know our patients probably are more forgiving and they don't really take us to the court but you know most of these patients if they take you to the court there will be very little that you know you you could do about it and there are nice this guidelines for improving outcomes in people with bone tumors you know they all they, they recommend that this this should be treated by multidisciplinary team who are who are very regularly or dedicatedly you know doing bone tumors surgeries and there should be a team of surgeons medical oncologists radiation oncologists pathologists and radiologists who are looking at every case uh, you know uh, uh, every case uh, in in a joint meeting one of my very close friend has uh, you know given this uh, has this beautiful words told to me long back that knowledge is power ignorance is bliss but anything in between is dangerous and that is where we all fall unfortunately because knowledge speaks but wisdom listens and we should not forget that this is the hippocratic oath that all of us has taken from the on the first day of our mbbs training so thank you very much and i hope uh, you know this cases would sensitize all of you for a future i mean better uh, you know management for all your pathological fractures in future thank you thank you mandeep that was uh, wonderful you covered the topic of pathological fractures uh, so exhaustively showing us so many cases of complications that you know happen with pathological fractures i now invite uh, dr manish agarwal a man who needs no introduction my mentor one my one of my teachers to deliver his talk on differentiating infection from tumor how to be smart dr agarwal welcome sir good morning uh, yeah so the i first want to thank uh, chetan dr ram prabhu satish for uh, doing a symposium on tumors uh, something which is often neglected in orthopedics because of the rarity but i think it is very important to do this symposium because uh, like each and every speaker has stressed i think there are a lot of mistakes made out of ignorance and those mistakes cost our patients and that's the reason in theme of with this i have decided to speak on how to differentiate infections from tumors and this is a common dilemma presenting to every orthopedic surgeon multiple times in their practice and we have these discussions uh, every time uh, we sit in the lounge in the theater about uh, something being assumed to be infection and turns out otherwise or something being thought to be tumor and uh, turns out to be infection of course the latter one is not uh, that sad but uh, if you assume something to be infection and it turns out to be tumor that can cause bigger problems but when you go back and actually look at um, 
this particular topic, I have realized that you can actually be pretty smart in trying to avoid infections. Now, look at this picture. The, this picture is a, of a 10-year-old boy who had come with fever for five days, which is a usual presentation of and if you look at the x-ray very carefully, you can see a lamellated periosteal reaction. You can see a sclerosis. All this suggests that this could be infection. Now look at what happened. It was assumed to be infection. The surgeon went ahead and did a debridement. And the pathologist said, this is an Ewing sarcoma. Now this happens very, very frequently. And now it's a disaster because of the extensive contamination which has been caused by the debridement. This is another five-year-old boy who's come with a lot of pain and swelling in his near his uh, fibula in the distal part of the leg. He again is running fever. This has been there for three months. You can clearly see a lamellated periosteal reaction involving the fibula. The radiologist on the MR has reported this as osteomyelitis. I mean, very clearly has written that this is an infective pathology such as osteomyelitis. Undergoes debridement, as we've seen before, and the pathology is again an evening sarcoma. Now, again, this is disaster because of the contamination and this child in all probability is going to lose his leg. Yet another 15 year old boy who's come with this uh, X-ray feature showing a lytic lesion with some sclerosis, some periosteal reaction. And like Bhavin would have said that this is something which would have required further imaging. But again, MRI was done. The radiologist reported this as an osteomyelitis and this was debrided. And this turned out to be an osteosarcoma, a conventional high-grade osteosarcoma, again, adding considerable difficulty now in trying to do a limb-saving surgery. So the big question that we have to ask ourselves is that are we missing and messing tumors with infection? And is there any way in which we can actually identify between uh, infection and tumors before doing any intervention? Now, the first thing we need to do is, is not to assume. And we've seen this being spoken again and again. And I'm just going to play this video clip, which I think is the best way of illustrating why not to assume anything. Because when you assume, assume, and as the spelling goes, you make an ass of you and me. I'm going to tell you how that happened to a friend of mine. His name was, uh, he's a very profound doctor, uh, a gastroenterologist. And he got a call from his patient, Mr. Abdul, who said, uh, Dr. Sir, my wife is really, really ill and she's got a big stomach ache and she can't sit uh, and she can't sleep and she's in big uh, pain. Can, can I come and visit you? And he said, yeah, by all means. And like all patients today, he has done his research. He's gone into the internet and he said, Usko ye ho sakta, ho sakta. And the, the doctor said, don't worry, let me handle it. And he checked her out and he said, she has an infected uh, appendix. So I have to do a surgery and she'll be fine. The surgery was done. He was fine. And, Dr. and Abdul was a happy man. One year later, he calls back the doctor and says, uh, Sir, uh, uh, my wife has got a stomachache. Uh, please do the appendix operation. She'll be fine. Uh, so uh, doctor said, uh, Dr. Manoj said, listen, that, uh, uh, you know, I'm the doctor. Let me diagnose what I have to. Please bring her to the, uh, to the clinic and we'll fix her. We said, Nanny, yes, sir, fix, fix up that operation uh, date. We'll do it in half an hour and we'll be back. Just uh, she needs an appendix removed. So now he's losing his patience. He says, let me do the diagnosis. Uh, Abdul, bring her to the uh, clinic. And he's still insisting, and finally the doctor lost it, and he said, listen, I'm the doctor, and let me tell you that every human being has only one appendix, and I've already taken out the appendix, so please don't tell me how to do my job. Abdul waited very patiently for the doctor to finish with his assumptions, and then he shot back very neatly. He said, sir, I agree with you. Every human being can have one appendix, but a man can have two wives, right? So it's, it's extremely important. I think in life, we are always taught that uh, if you have an option between assuming something bad and assuming something good, we always assume the good. We never assume anything bad. 
But when it comes to oncology, it's exactly the opposite. I think if, if you have to differentiate and you cannot differentiate between uh, infection and tumor, I would say you should assume that this is a tumor unless you've proven that this is not. Because if you assume otherwise, I think we're going to be in trouble. The patient is going to be in trouble. Now, the things that one can do to prevent infection is actually making like an MRI with contrast. And we should also do a biopsy as we have heard with all tumors, because even in infection, a biopsy can give you that certainty that you're not dealing with something malignant. Now, what are the clues that we can see on imaging? Now, this is a 25-year-old uh, man whose X-ray looks apparently all right, though he was having all these symptoms which look like infection. Now, you can see a periosteal reaction on the lateral view. There's a little bit of uh, scalloping, but other than that, there's nothing much. But the MRI shows that there is a big abscess. And now this is an MRI with contrast. You can see that there's an abscess behind the femur. The contrast shows you that there is a thick wall and there is a necrotic uh, pus inside. You can see in the marrow that there is uh, edema. There is some fat sparing and all this is giving you clues that this is infection and this was proven to be an infection. Now, this is another 16 year old girl who's come with this kind of a periosteal reaction on the femur with pain, with the elevated ESR. Again, everything suggesting infection. And an MRI shows you a lot of edema in the soft tissues. And more importantly, it gives you something which is diagnostic. You can actually see a sequestrum inside that osteolytic cavity, telling you or giving you a very strong uh, feel or assumption that this is infection. And still, I would say you should biopsy this. And this was biopsied and proven to be infection. Now, this is another girl. 12 year old who's had pain and swelling for three months with all obvious signs of infection. WBC is 12,400, ESR is very high, CRP is high. But an MRI, if you do, can show you what clinches the diagnosis. And Bhavin did touch upon it. When you see fat sparing in the marrow, as you see here, this is very unlikely to be a tumor. You can also see a pass, uh, an abscess or a collection in the uh, posterior part of the distal femur. And these are the contrast scans which tell you that you've got intramedullary as well as uh, an abscess in the soft tissues behind the femur telling you that this is infection. Now, if you don't see these signs, I think you have to assume this is tumor. Another importance, again, from the previous two cases which I showed you is that we do not believe the radiology reports. And very few radiologists, in fact, have enough experience to be able to tell you. And those who have experience actually will tell you that it is very, very difficult to be accurate very often in these cases. So it's best to biopsy, will keep you safe and will keep our patients safe. Now, why is the biopsy so important? So you'll see this another four-year-old girl, radiological features showing uh, a lytic lesion, a solid periosteal reaction, has thigh pain, has night pain, high ESR, LDH is high, alkaline phosphatase is high. Everything is telling you that this could be anything. This could be infection. This could be an Ewing sarcoma. So this was biopsy. You can see from the imaging that there's a lot of soft tissue edema. There's cortical destruction. There's a periosteal reaction. There's some newborn formation. The biopsy showed this is a Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Now, this case just illustrates that this is something which we must always consider in the differential diagnosis, it's not just between tumor or infection or evings and infection. It is also Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And the importance of doing the biopsy is that once this is picked up, you don't need any surgery. All you need is a steroid injection and, and this whole lesion heals up. Now, this is another uh, patient who's had a sclerotic lesion with pain. You can see this sclerosis in the distal femur. When you look at the MRI, things are a little more obvious. You can see some ill-defined uh, edemas. You can see some uh, destructive lesion. You can see a soft tissue mass. So with the sclerosis and soft tissue mass, we assume this is an osteosarcoma. This was a CT scan showing, again, the permeative destruction, sclerosis, 
So our working diagnosis was an osteosarcoma. We went ahead, biopsied this, and found that this was tuberculosis. Now, this is a happy ending. But unfortunately, because we suspected this is an osteosarcoma, we didn't collect material for culture. And this is where that rule always comes in that please biopsy what you uh, uh, culture and culture what you biopsy. So every time, if you don't use a frozen section and we don't know whether this is infection or tumor, you must have both the cultures as well as the histopathology. Now, this is another 11-year-old girl who had a fall eight days ago, came with very severe pain, was not able to walk, massive tense, swelling on the back of the knee, would jump on just touching, was running fever. Uh, the ultrasound said this is a hematoma, which was done. The ESR was not high, the CRP was normal, WBC was slightly elevated, nothing to suggest infection. This is the MR picture, which shows a big mass sitting behind the knee. The contrast images actually show that the center is all necrotic, just like an abscess. And the surrounding, there is a lot of edema. Um, it could have been an infection, but a biopsy was done. Now, biopsy shows this is a necrotic tumor. This was actually a synovial uh, sarcoma with an extensive infarctoid necrosis, which happened because of trauma. And here, because we had a diagnosis of sarcoma, it could be excised without anybody trying to do an IND. And this patient ended up with a happy outcome. So at the end of this whole talk, I think there are a few uh, take home messages. Number one is that we don't assume anything to be infection unless we've got It's better to assume tumor and do a biopsy and then rule out an infection or a tumor. We should not do any surgery unless the patient has been worked up and this holds true for anything, whether it's a pathological fracture or any swelling that, that we are seeing. The very important fact is that we should not assume that the radiologist is correct. And in fact, you may realize that at times the orthopedic surgeon understands more radiology than many of the radiologists, especially when it comes to musculoskeletal tumors. It's very important to biopsy still, even though you have strong radiology signs, a biopsy is absolutely necessary for you to confirm the diagnosis. And last but not the least, we must culture what we biopsy and biopsy what we culture. That way we don't miss anything and the chances of errors are very small. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, such a <coughs> useful uh, topic that you covered that is differentiating infection from tumor. We so often see one, you know, confused with the other. Now I invite uh, Ms. Karen Shepherd for delivering the second guest lecture of this program. She will be talking on metastatic bone disease tips for an orthopedic surgeon. Ms. Karen Shepherd is a consultant orthopedic and oncological surgeon in the Montgomery unit of the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Orthopedic Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, Oswestry, England. Welcome, Ms. Karen. Hello. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but apparently um, I'm not allowed. The host disabled uh, participant screen sharing. Yeah, maybe she'll have to be made a co-host. Now, now you can share the screen, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Yes, we can see you. Okay. okay, thank you for inviting me today. So I'm um, one of the oncology surgeons from Oswestry in England. Um, and we are one of the five bone tumor centers in uh, England um, that also look after uh, soft tissue sarcoma and a significant part of our practice is uh, metastatic disease. So in England, um, uh, the bone tumour services uh, centralised these five centres to ensure that patients with this diagnosis are treated by uh, the specialists that they require. Um, and, and of course, England is a lot smaller than um, 
than India. And so really the maximum distance that any patient has to travel is probably uh, one to 200 miles. So not, not quite so bad. Um, but what we're also trying to do in England is um, uh, make metastatic bone disease a, a, a subspecialty within itself. I suspect this will be a five to 10 year process, but it's certainly something that we're trying to change in that uh, district general hospitals <clears throat> probably don't have the expertise that is now needing to be considered um, given the change in, in um, particularly the oncological management. So uh, there are two points that uh, I probably want to highlight through this talk and the first one is that metastatic bone disease is not just one disease. And it's not just one disease from an orthopedic perspective, but it's certainly not one disease from an oncological perspective. And this is now changing the way that we are really looking at this subspecialty. So we know it's a common problem and it's becoming a bigger problem because people are living longer with their cancer. And uh, given that time frame, um, people are often getting more than one cancer. So if they've got rid of one and they're living longer, then they may actually get another as a result of their poor genetics or as a result of uh, the oncological treatment that they've had. Patients often present with skeletal related events, so fracture, pain on weight bearing, um, scenarios such as metastatic core compression. Um, and treatment options do include surgery, um, but the decision for surgery is now becoming more complex. Um, but the second key point really of this talk is that management for metastatic bone disease must be guided by prognosis, which sounds an easy thing. But again, the oncological management is changing. And therefore, I would argue that probably the average orthopaedic surgeon doesn't necessarily understand a lot about oncology and the treatments that are now available and therefore the decision to know what to do surgically isn't guided by knowledge unless you are going to the oncologist directly. So this is a key document that we use in the uh, UK and it's guided by the British Orthopaedic Oncology Society BOOS um, and the BOA. Um, it can be downloaded off the internet and it's quite a short document, it's quite a nice document um, for a 10 minute read really. Um, and there's lots of points in this but the, the, the biggest point again with regards to prognosis is that if patients are living or you expect them to live that less than six weeks, it doesn't matter whether they're fractured, it doesn't matter whether they're in pain, and I'll come to that in a moment, um, you're not really going to gain anything by operating on them. You're actually going to act as a euthanasia surgeon, really. Um, the, when they are in pain though, and, it, and it, I appreciate it's probably easier for me to say here in the UK because we have very close and direct links with palliative care, but that's actually where these patients should be treated with appropriate analgesia um, and support in the community with their fracture until, uh, until their demise. Um, for patients that are living, um, potentially going to be living three to six months, and we have uh, another option, but it certainly shouldn't be huge, invasive, expensive surgery. And if they're going to live more than six months, and really you need to give them um, an optimum implant uh, that is going to last their lifetime. And it's very difficult to predict how long some of these patients are going to live now. Um, you know, is it going to be six months? Is it going to be years, for example? And the oncological treatment is changing that, that picture. Okay, so this is your standard exam answer, really, for metastatic bone disease is the five um, tumours that go to the bones are the breast, prostate, um, but we do need to be aware of the myeloma and the lymphoma, so the hematological ones. But I would argue that any cancer can go to the bone. So I, I often have conversations with other um, surgeons, GI surgeons, um, uh, gynecology surgeons, and say, well, esophageal or endometrial doesn't go to the bones. Well, it, it does. Um, and because we're a super specialist centre, then we see sort of more of the weird or the strange or the rare, but that anything can go to the bones. But beyond that, you need to understand that 
is this a primary bone tumour? So uh, you almost need to take a step back. And if some patients have got not necessarily a history of cancer or certainly uh, a long period of time from their primary cancer diagnosis to the bone mats, then you've got to question whether these are actually bone mats and, and we go back to the biopsy principles. This would be an F, a standard FRCS question and, and I've kept it in because I, I know a lot of people on, the, on this talk are qualified orthopaedic surgeons post exam, but actually uh, what it does is make you think about how you can triage these patients. So Mrs. Smith came to my attention because she'd been admitted with pelvic pain actually. Um, and they x-rayed a leg or they, they x-rayed a pelvis and the top of this lesion was identified so they x-rayed a femur. Um, but she was absolutely asymptomatic with regards to this lesion. Um, so the, the standard question is, um, what, what do you think is the cause of this? And, and this is how I would answer it. So if somebody is uh, probably over 50 and some would argue over 40, then the top of your list may well be um, a, a bone metastatic lesion. Um, but you actually need to think about the hematological malignancies, lymphoma, myeloma, um, but you also need to consider a primary bone tumour. Um, and so it would be really easy just to put a nail down this. Um, but I've told you she has no pain. So the question is, and we go back to the booze guidelines, if you don't have any pain, then the argument is, is to leave well alone. This lady um, incidentally did have a biopsy because we didn't know what the cause of her disease was and we biopsied a pelvic lesion and she was found to have breast cancer. And um, we, she was essentially dying. She came in an extremist. We started letrozole um, and three months later, she was planned for an operation for the femur, um, but COVID hit, so we delayed her and she'd been on denosumab and all those sorts of things. Um, and she is still mobilizing. She's mobilizing now fully weight bearing. We haven't actually operated on her and I don't think we will need to. So things are changing. So again, I'm going through the things that you already know, but just, just to clarify the information. So breast cancer is often lytic and sclerotic. It's a mixed lesion. Uh, we've um, looked at the prognostic factors with regards to breast cancer and how to direct their care, and I'll, sh I'll share these with you in a moment. Prostate cancer tends to be sclerotic. It's certainly sclerotic after treatment, particularly after the hormonal or the radiotherapy input. But if it's lytic, especially when you've had all those treatments, it is highly suggestive that the prostate cancer is now de-differentiated, it's escaped, it's not responding to the hormonal input. So anything that you do surgically, your prognosis is probably now becoming quite low. And you need to be considering as to, is an operation going to help this patient? Because they probably have three to six months of life left if they've got escaped prostate disease at this point. And again, we looked at the prognostic indicators. So for breast cancer and prostate cancer, we found that if somebody comes in with low hemoglobin and low albumin, it's a really good way of looking at the patient's physiological health. They can't maintain their blood stock and they can't maintain their albumin. Then it's highly suggestive that the rest of the body is not working very well. High alk phos uh, al alkaline phosphatase, as you would expect, but high calcium in breast cancer is a, is a poor prognostic sign. It's saying that their bones are becoming overloaded by disease. In breast cancer, if they're young and have visceral metastases, it's a poor prognostic sign. But as I've already uh, suggested, in prostate cancer, if their PSA is relatively low, particularly if it's been high in the past, but they've got signs of active disease, it's a really bad sign. It means that their prostate cancer now is not producing PSA and it's de-differentiated. And if patients require surgical intervention for prostate cancer, this is a poor prognostic sign. So that's not to say that surgery or the surgery that's performed is bad, but it's just saying that if it's bad enough to need surgery, then it's not a good sign. Okay, kidney and thyroid are both lytic. They both bleed a lot shortly um, that we did. Um, if there's evidence uh, or there's low evidence of other disease, then the prognosis can be quite good. 
And, and in both cancers now, there is targeted therapy that can keep these patients living for many, many years. So renal mats and thyroid mats, you may consider um, uh, uh, being aggressive in your surgical approach in order to give them more time and to manage the disease. So this is an example of what we would do with a, a renal mat. I acknowledge that probably our tumours are a bit smaller than some of them that I've seen this morning. Uh, but the patient was about to fracture from this lytic lesion. We would always perform preoperative embolization. And you can see this is the uh, catheter coming down here from the uh, angiogram. These are the tumour vessels. And this is the coil in here that we would use to block off the tumour vessels. So what we do in the operation, if we can, is this plate is put on top and bottom, ignoring the middle bit before we even go into the tumour. Uh, we then stabilise the bone. And then when everything's ready, we've got all the blood products ready, um, then we go into the tumour and curatage it. And it's not un uncommon, um, even with preoperative embolization for a patient to dump a litre of blood at this point. So they still bleed a huge amount. And you need to have the expertise in theatre to be able to deal with that and, and then get this patient physiologically well, well again as a result of that, that insult really that we do. We will then um, put in cement into the cavity from uh, where we've curataged and these screws are then put in through the cement when it's curing, when it's cement, when it's setting. Um, so that this becomes a, a whole uh, bone cement um, plate interface. Um, and what it means is that the, the tumour can grow a little bit, but um, it, it tends to grow very slowly around this and you don't need bone biology in order to heal. Um, you don't need the, the bone to manage the fracture or the defect that you've created. You're not putting in dead material such as bone graft. Um, and, and we have really good outcomes with this technique. Lung cancer tends to have a mixed appearance, um, but it tends to be more aggressive. Um, historically, metastatic bone disease from lung has a really poor prognosis, as in many months, a short number of months, sorry. But we've, we know now that targeted therapies, which are targeting the genetics of the tumour, are allowing patients to live for much longer. And EGFR and ALK mutations are, are ones that are banded around, but there's a huge number coming through and a, and a huge number of treatments. So for example, this lady, um, the top left picture, um, she presented with, uh, with hip pain to us. Uh, so she was referred to us as a primary bone sarcoma um, and we staged her, did a chest, abdomen and pelvis and we found a primary bone, a primary lung tumour with huge metastases bilaterally. Um, and whilst a hip was hurting and it was um, you know, quite an extensive lesion in the hip, we felt that taking it to theatre at that point with the lungs in this state was, was really high risk and, and probably wasn't in her best interest. And at that point, we didn't know what her um, genetic status was in terms of the targeted therapies. So we sent her off to the oncologist with some crutches um, and the oncologist, oh, after we biopsied her, so that we'd got tissue from her. And the oncologist tested that tissue and gave a targeted therapy. And the CT scan from below that is three months worth of targeted therapy. So the metastases are essentially scar tissue now in the lungs. The primary is significantly decreased, but she continued to have hip pain. So um, given that she was much better physiologically again, she'd had time to eat properly and, and to be well. We then excised the proximal femur and did a proximal femoral replacement for her. So she's recently died after this case and um, she lived for two and a half years. So um, if you looked at her pictures right at the beginning, you may have just signed her off, but actually the targeted therapy is making a huge difference. So this implant has lasted her lifetime. So why biopsy? We've had lots of discussion on biopsy, but certainly from a metastatic perspective, if somebody has a, a solitary bone lesion, even if it's got a past history of, of cancer, you need to exclude a primary bone tumour and you need to exclude other tumours. So we've um, 
we're about to publish our results on bone biopsies in our centre. Um, and we know that up to um, 30 to 40 percent of people have a different diagnosis on biopsy to, to their primary cancer. So it's important that a bone biopsy is considered. If patients have got a long disease free survival, uh, again, is it another tumour? Is it a different tumour? And we know particularly in breast cancer, their receptor status can change so they can drop their um, estrogen positivity, they may become herceptin positive, for example. So it again um, uh, allows us to target, to target the oncological therapies. And if it doesn't fit with the imaging, then just get a biopsy. There's lots of ways that fracture risk can be measured, um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but my biggest assessment for people for fracture risk is pain. So if you've got pain, and particularly pain on weight bearing, it's a sign that the structural um, integrity of the bone is starting to, to decrease. So please give them um, aids to help them walk. Please give them crutches, for example, if it's a lower limb. Potentially consider a brace or a sling for an upper limb. Um, the mirror score is something that people talk about a lot in the literature. We really don't like this score. We think it's subjective um, and have developed a different way of being able to measure fracture risk. And that's by putting patients on a set of scales. So if they are able to put more than 86% of their weight through the, the, through the affected limb by standing on one leg, for example, their fracture risk is fairly low. Less than that, you really need to be thinking about whether they're about to fracture and do you need to do something about it. I use CT quite a lot to look at the bone destruction aspect of the lesion and to see what the lesion is doing to the bone. Um, an MRI will tell me what's happening in the rest of the limb and will help me with surgical planning, but it doesn't give you a fracture risk really. So we've got a huge MDT um, and we're very lucky in having this. Um, so when we have patients come through, um, we will often put them through the MDT so we can look at their previous pathology. Uh, we can guide their biopsy, um, which has been discussed before. And actually, where do you want to put the needle? Where does that need to go in terms of your surgical plan? But we also have good links with the oncologists and, and of course, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, um, are key uh, treatments. But we're starting to change with this now. There's bisphosphonates and donosumab. We use a lot of donosumab in uh, metastatic bone disease, and it's meaning that we're not operating as much. Um, and then there are targeted therapies, which is revolutionising the management of metastatic bone disease, both onco oncologically, but um, certainly from a, a surgical perspective. You need to understand what targeted therapies these patients may be uh, able to receive because it will affect your prognosis. So when to operate? Well, again, pain is a really important aspect of why you would operate. Um, if you can help somebody's pain, you're going to help their quality of life. Um, if they don't have pain, I really question whether we should operate. And, it, and I probably, the only reason I will operate at that point if they have no pain is if they're imminently about to fracture, but it's rare that you don't have pain if they're about to fracture. So. Um, just uh, have a have a thought is there anything else that you can do to avoid an operation for these patients um any surgical decision making is is directed by life expectancy and this depends on the tumor type um, it depends on whether they've got other systemic disease and it depends on whether they can tolerate the, the surgery that you're suggesting um, but I would argue that what is central to this is actually the patient's wishes and expectations and a lot of that takes time in clinic to work out. And I appreciate it's not always easy to have, find that time, but you may be doing something really significant to a patient that may not actually make any difference. Um, and that's not fair on them or their family really. So the, this is sort of really my surgical serve, yes or no to an operation. If they've got pain or at high risk of fracture, and that, that goes into my, my group for operating. If they've got a fracture that's unlikely to heal, and we know that um, metastatic bone disease is difficult to heal because of the tumour, but also then the other treatments that you probably want to give, such as radiotherapy. And if there are no other uh, non-surgical options, then um, surgery is an option. 
where I caveat that a little bit is, for example, the prostate patient that's now escaped uh, treatment. If you go ahead and do an operation, they've got nothing left after that operation to treat them. They've got no further hormonal therapy. They've probably already had some maybe therapy. They're probably physiologically not capable of having chemotherapy. So your operation may be very palliative. It may give them comfort in the next few months of life. But if they've only got a few weeks to live, then please consider not operating and give appropriate palliative care. So non-operative, as I've discussed before, no pain, don't operate, try and avoid it. Um, if they're not going to live very long or you're at risk of euthanizing them, and, and not, that's not just on the table, but within a few days or a few weeks of treatment, you've not done the right thing by them. And if there's no surgical option, then you can't operate. So my surgical principles are primarily to uh, improve quality of life, treat the pain and hopefully prevent the fractures. The implant, and this is by the BOOS um, BOA uh, document that I showed you at the beginning, the implant should allow immediate weight bearing and it should last the lifetime of the patient. That's where it's becoming a bit more complex and you now need to think about it a bit more with your oncologist. You can kill a patient by operating on them. That, that's not good form. And therefore, the decisions have to be taken before you proceed to surgery. Um, you can cause an infection. And if they become infected, then that affects their targeted therapies, their chemotherapy, their radiotherapy options. And the disease, of course, can progress. So surgical treatments um, in, in, I think, there are three groups, really. Um, and I'm interested as to whether um, over in India, if you feel that this is the same, I suspect it's not from a financial perspective. Um, however, I think if somebody's got a reasonably, reasonably good prognosis, and by that I'm saying more than six months, it's especially if it's a solitary lesion, you biopsy it first and then you replace it. Um, and that's for, for us an endoprosthetic replacement. Um, the other end of the spectrum is an intramedullary nail. So um, we don't do this very often. We don't do nails very often. And the reason why we don't is by putting that nail in, you've now seeded the tumour up and down the femur. And it doesn't matter whether it's primary bone or whether it's a mat. You then know that um, those tumour cells are going to affect the rest of the bone. So if this patient lives longer than you expect them to, the nail will break, the bone will break, they will have ongoing pain, so you're still not treating the condition that they came to you with. Um, and then any subsequent treatment will mean the whole of the femur needs to be addressed. So uh, even in the UK, this is still first line for metastatic disease and, it, and it, it's something that we really do need to be looking at. It's about looking at the patient, looking at their prognosis. And then the middle ground is the plate cement fixation, which we have really good results with, particularly in the upper limb. Sometimes in the lower limb, we, we do this. Um, and I would say this is for a few months, uh, six to 12 months probably of prognosis. Okay, so just some, some cases. The, the X-ray here shows a, a mixed lytic sclerotic lesion in the proximal femur. Uh, this lady was newly diagnosed, so um, she was treatment naive to uh, the breast cancer. Um, she didn't want an operation, even though she was in loads of pain and she was in minerals 12. That should have necessitated surgery, but she said, no, let's go on the hormones, let's have some radiotherapy, let's have this bisphenate. Um, and you can see on the other side that she's now got quite a sclerotic proximal femur, but they, the treatment that she was naive to has worked really well and she still hasn't had any surgery on her hip. If the patient is compliant, uh, it may be worth giving them some time on the drugs. So this lady was known to have had breast cancer in the past. Um, she wasn't known with METS, but she developed severe left hip pain. So. Um, if I was a GP or an oncologist, then I'd want to get imaging of that. Never trust why somebody's got pain when they've got a previous history of cancer. Uh, she's had a bone scan, and actually this is an isolated proximal femoral lesion. So by definition, she gets a biopsy. Um, and we do all of our biopsies image-guided, either through the CT scanner, through fluoroscopy, or through ultrasound. Um, and this was breast cancer. And she, again, she had a proximal femoral replacement. 
I'm reminding you this will allow her to have immediate weight bearing and last the lifetime of, of the patient. And this was what she was able to do after that proximal femur. She was a very compliant, very um, responsive patient. I wouldn't say lots of people can do this, but uh, it was her way of getting on with her life. And, and she certainly did that. Whereas a similar X-ray for a man with hip pain with known prostate cancer, his workup shows that he's got extensive disease through his body. He's escaped prostate cancer now. Um, and actually, just to give him some pain relief in the last few months of his life, he had a, a quick, straightforward operation, and that was the HS stabilization stop fracture. So why do we do, why do we go um, through so many options and, and so much effort in order to make the decision to operate or indeed not? So this patient was known to have um, renal um, metastatic uh, bone disease from, from kidney. Uh, so it was nailed because it was fractured. Um, the, the, the femur then continued to have lytic lesions throughout ongoing pain. Um, patients responding really well to the targeted therapies, but anecdotally, and I don't think the research is out there in a strong fashion yet, um, is that this targeted therapy is good for soft tissue, but I don't think it's as good for bone. Um, some papers agree with that, some don't. So I, I think the, the jury's out with that at the minute, but certainly in our hands, we're seeing that it, in renal, that it doesn't seem to work as well. Um, and as a result of this operation, they then need a whole femur uh, EPR, which is pretty extreme when we could have done something much smaller um, if we'd got this patient at the outset. This patient uh, was known to have had two previous cancers, a liver cancer and prostate cancer, presented with a fracture. Uh, the local hospital nailed it, because that's straight, that's what you do for humoral fractures in their trust. Um, and that he's got previous cancer, so therefore it'll treat that in some way. Um, he continued to have pain, and you can see that this has got a huge soft tissue mass. And he's now got soft tissue masses where the, uh, where the screws were at the, at the bottom. And actually, when we biopsied this, uh, it came back as a bone sarcoma. So this was now his third cancer. Um, and he'd had really a year of horrendous pain and nobody particularly listening to him. And the result of this then is either an amputation or a, a whole human replacement. So... If you're not, even with this chap, you know, he's got prostate cancer and he'd had previous liver cancer, but he was in theory cured or stable in those. You can't always assume biopsy if you can. Okay, so in summary, I think the patients with metastatic bone disease um, are high risk patients. In our unit, despite the things that we do with primary bones and, and, and soft tissue sarcomas, I would say that they are most physiologically delicate patients that we have. They're often older, have comorbidities, and they need to be assessed carefully uh, in order to plan what's required next. And that may not be surgery. Um, and overall, your treatment is to improve quality of life. You will not extend life by operating on them in the, in the majority. So final slide, uh, anybody with previous history of bone, uh, with uh, uh, previous history of cancer, with bone limb or joint pain, please x-ray. And if you don't get the answers you need from that x-ray, you may require further imaging and refer to a centre that know what they're doing with these patients. The blood tests I like, and these are straightforward blood tests really, is the full blood counts look at the haemoglobin and white cell count, their renal profile to check overall health, bone profile to be looking at their calcium in particular. They need a myeloma screen, irrespective of what their previous cancer was. If they're an old person with a bone lesion, do a myeloma screen, and then a man do a PSA. That's me done. Thank you so much, Karen, for covering this topic on metastatic bone disease so extensively, I'm sure You've given so much valuable information to all our listeners today. I now uh, invite all the panelists and the faculty and Dr. Uh, Ram Prabhu and uh, Dr. Satish Nuthai's panels for the next uh, uh, part of this uh, webinar, that is case presentation. 
I invite Dr. Michel to present his case first, followed by Dr. Pratik, and after that, uh, Dr. Agarwal sir with his cases. And then we'll see if we have more time, we will involve more of the faculty. Chetan? Yes, sir. Chetan, there is a question yes, from Professor Dr. G.S. Kulkarni. He wants right. to know in an adamantinoma, uh, four year old, whether it is better. Excision and bone transport or local excision and bone graft. Uh, he has asked this question. Agarwal sir, would you like to answer that? Yes, actually, I did answer it on the chat. And I think a lot depends on what is the quality of bone which is still left. And uh, I think over uh, the last. The extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation of the bone, particularly for defects which don't involve the joint, that would be the best way of reconstructing. And if the defect is long, we can supplement it with a vascularized fibula. Now, if you don't have a good bone, or if the bone is fractured, or if the tumor is so big that uh, the bone, not much bone, is going to be left after we deprive the tumor after radiation, then you can use an allograft and combine it again with a vascularized fibula. Now, I don't have experience with bone transport. I have seen a couple of patients, and I think that long duration of treatment is extremely problematic. It's very difficult to image them uh, for an MRI. Should there be a recurrence or should anything else be required? For example, even if they need to get an MRI done for something else with the frame in place, it's very difficult for them to uh, get that done. And if you have a defect which is longer than 20 centimeters, then I think the period required or the time required for the whole thing to consolidate and mature is, is well over a year, which is something which is not uh, very patient friendly with all the multiple infections and all that in track infections which can happen. So I think in expert hands, smaller defects may be considered, but uh, I think overall uh, my patients have preferred to have something which is one step and uh, closed without having any anything from the outside going into the home. I hope that answers uh, the question, sir. So I think let's start with the case presentation. We are already beyond time. Michel, will you share your screen? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I would uh, request the host to enable uh, me to share my screen. Nikhil? Nikhil? Hello? Yeah, Nikhil, are you there? Okay, I got it, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So, I will be uh, presenting one case for discussion with the expert panel. So the case is a 31-year-old female who presented with pain and swelling over the left shin since the past two months. Uh, she had difficulty in weight bearing while walking and there was no history of any trauma. So she visited her orthopedic surgeon and she got evaluated. So uh, the first thing was done was the x-ray. So this is the x-ray. Uh, I would like, uh, if Dr. Bhavin is there, I would like him to just uh, uh, talk about the x-ray for the audience. Okay, so very quickly, I think we see an expansile osteolytic lesion in the proximal tibia. Uh, there, is, there are trabeculae, there's uh, endosteal scalloping. Um, and if you see the AP, I think there's a fracture that she's developed through the mid portion of the lesion. It does have a narrow zone of transition, so it could be a slowly growing lesion. But in the proximal tibia, when you see a long segment lesion like this with endosteal scalloping, you're always worried um, about the fact that this might be some form of an aggressive, uh, more aggressive lesion than, than others. So differentials, do we want to go into that or you just want to move on and then you'll come back to possibilities? We'll go into the differentials because the x-ray has been explained. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think if you just go back for a minute, um, 
all of those things like giant cell tumor, it doesn't reach the articular surface. None of those really are there. If you just use the expansive osteolytic lesion business, then both GCT and ABC are out. You're not dealing with uh, hemangioma, desmoplastic fibroma or any of those. So that's why we move on to something like a cartilage tumor or a fibrosis lesion or something on those lines, right? That's where uh, we would land up with. And I would really, really be wanting to rule out um, a cartilage tumor in this case. So we're not seeing specific cartilage uh, lesions here. Well, well th this kind of internal scalloping and thinning of the bone, I think uh, cartilage tumor should be the first differential. And I agree with Bhavin on, on that. I don't know, Bhavin, do you, do you think there is some uh, specs of calcification within the matrix? I'm not able to make out between that and the trabeculae. So, plus there's a fracture. So, that also is, I think, complicating the picture a little bit. What is that? And normally, cartilage tumors don't fracture like this. That is the, my other concern. So, then are we just dealing with a fibrosis lesion, uh, which has fractured? What is, that? You know? what is the age, Michelle? 31 years. 35. Huh? 30s, early 30s. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Uh, I would keep a differential of a metabolic uh, bone disease that's also right. in mind. Yeah, that's yes. right. Brown Brown tumor. Tumor. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, but uh, Yogesh, if you look at the lateral x ray, can you see there is a sharp transition from the scalloping to the thick cortex on the anterior? Yes. Yes. Now, you know, metabolic generally is a more systemic uh, loss of bone. You won't get just a uh, destruction of bone. This is more like a primary tumor. Yeah, but the kind of the cortical thinning that has happened without any expansion and rarefaction in the it's inflammatory just, area. It's only in the region of the legion. It's not... Yeah, it's but less. I think given the, the larger audience, I think we can put that as part of the differential so that, you know, we don't forget it. I think, Michelle, you should move on. Come on. Michelle, move on. Yeah. yeah. This was yeah, a little soft tissue. Why it is not a giant cell tumor or an ABC? Infection, metabolic disease that we have already seen through this talk that is a... to be kept in mind and ruled out over uh, the period of investigation. So, what's next? What what do we do next? Uh, depending on you know what are our differentials and what we need to do to achieve a diagnosis. So do we do a CT scan? Do we do an MRI? Do we do a PET scan directly? Uh, now we've already seen in the evaluation of bone tumors that an X-ray is usually followed by an MRI when you are suspecting a bone lesion. So the orthopedic surgeon here has done an MRI and I just share it. I'm sorry, I don't have many pictures and not very great pictures either, but this is what I have. If we can, you know, uh, get anything from this. Well, you know, we're seeing a cystic lesion and I can see some fluid levels as well. Um, so there seems to be some kind of an ABC transformation for sure. And then if you look at your uh, coronal images, there are some dark areas. Some of that may be trabeculum related. There isn't a lot of marrow edema. Um, and there is some periosteous edema, but that may be again related to that fracture that we saw in the um, in the radiograph. So right now there are some ABC features, uh, but that also mean rule out um, an present with fluid levels, the so-called telangiectatic. Though other features are not there, but uh, the point, of course, here is that we don't assume this to be ABC unless proven otherwise. If you see here, this is the. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Consideration, and this is the opposite tibia that was imaged uh, in the scan. Oh, okay. So there right. is the opposite so tibia the, the lesion on the other side. Uh, very interesting because then uh, metabolic. Uh, which would anyway have to be ruled out for bilateral with ABC transformation.
Yeah. So this is what was reported uh, by the radiologist. If you see, they have reported multiple lesions in the distal femoral metaphysis and in the iliac uh, blade as well. And then they have committed to a diagnosis of suggestive of polyosteotic fibrous dysplasia. So does it make us any wiser? We have an X-ray, we have the MRI, we know we have characterized the lesions. So what next? What are the blood investigations, Michel? Any blood investigations done? Nothing done till now. So I would like to know uh, the basic bloods, parameters, plus the alkaline phosphorase and serum calcium phosphorus levels. That's absolutely right. Because things are not fitting here according to me. So then what was planned was a biopsy by the orthopedic surgeon. They did not go for blood investigations. They thought it is a fibrous dysplasia and went in for CT guided biopsy of both the lesions. Now, if you see, this is the report uh, where material from the left TBL biopsy, which is the larger lesion, has come up to be non diagnostic. And the lesion which was on the right side, which was a smaller lesion, they have got a very uh, a fibrosseous lesion with osteoclastic giant cells, and they have given an impression of an osteofibrous dysplasia. Yeah, okay, but we can still get the bloods done, blood counts done yes. now. Yeah. Yes. So now again, there is a confusion of what to do next, whether we accept this diagnosis because it doesn't fit in the age group. And what about the other TB and what about the other lesions? So like you are stressing, sir, it, it is very necessary to rule out a metabolic uh, bone disorder by doing blood investigation. So this was what was planned for the patient and then patient apparently went for opinions and then this is what I got the patient to do, a parathyroid hormone level and a calcium level. Yeah. It seemed to be alarmingly high and this is probably the learning point from this presentation that investigations, even the smallest and the simplest of the blood investigations are very, very important to reach a diagnosis before you know, you put, subject the patient to any invasive procedure. So with the high parathyroid hormone, high calcium level, I suspected a primary uh, parathyroid adenoma, got a USG of the neck, which confirmed the same. And you can see there are three hypoechoic lesions in the parathyroid region. And it was diagnosed as a brown tumor. And with the adenectomy, the patient has recovered well. So just like pressing upon all the talks that have happened since morning, step-by-step -step evaluation, importance of a clinical radiological correlation, importance of a multidisciplinary board, and blood investigations, and metabolic diseases, infections, they mimic bone tumors, and hence, we should not just stick to one thing, keep our mind open, and do a gamut of investigations before subjecting the patient to any, any intervention. Excellent case, uh, Michelle. I think there was a lot of learning in this particular case. Thank you so much. I now invite Pratik to share his screen and uh, present his case. So, first of all, a very good afternoon to all and uh, to all the panelists and also to all the members who have logged in for this talk. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Chetan Anson sir for giving this opportunity for me to be sharing the and also to the Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society. So now without wasting much time, let's uh, progress to the case for discussion. This is courtesy of a case which was seen by a colleague of mine, Dr. Navneet Kamar, and he's been gracious enough to share the images with me. So the history of the case is such that, shall make it a full screen. Full screen, yeah. Okay, yeah. 
to come into the industry. It's a 35 year old female, a homemaker who had been complaining of a swelling around the knee since a few weeks. But since the past few days, she developed pain, which was following a trivial trauma. So she visited an orthopedic surgeon who got a X ray done. And this was the X ray which was she presented with. So I, I guess we can have a discussion on this X ray. So maybe uh, Dr. Bhavin Tenkari would like to comment on this. So, after the still a few more and um, it has fractured as well yeah. uh, that's pretty much what we're seeing now when it reaches the articular surface the first diagnosis we have is of a giant cell tumor but a giant cell tumor generally does not have a sclerotic rim. And so then we start looking for other alternatives, which include chondroblastoma. And funnily, a clear cell chondrosarcoma can have a sclerotic rim, which is, which is unusual as well. And so this is where we are. We have a tumor, it's fractured, it's worrisome, it's locally aggressive, and we need to image further with an MR and then biopsy and take it from there. This is something which the gender orthopedician is more likely to see in his clinic. And uh, then we come to the question of what are the differentials. And as Sir mentioned, giant cell tumor is probably on the list higher up. And then we have to think of other things like probably an aneurysmal bone cells, uh, a clear cell chondrosarcoma uh, as well. So the next step that the orthopedician took was to stabilize her. He put her a splint and then sent her for a MRI. So these are the MRI images that we have. So we also have other sequences in these. So if we can have some discussion on this. So why don't you go through all the images all and the then images. you can come yeah. back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are the so these are the actual sections. Okay. We also have a surgical section. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, right so now, there are dark and there. yeah. So there are dark and bright areas within because she's fractured. There's some blood as well. There's some arrow edema, some periosteous edema. I don't think uh, these findings are characteristic of a specific etiology, uh, and therefore we should assume the worst and just go ahead and biopsy a solid component. And I'll tell you what is worrisome. There are solid components. To the opposite side that normally doesn't happen with one of these primary giant cell tumors also something has now gone into the joint space as well yeah. and so this is all very very worrisome and while i'm not seeing osteoid those dark areas are really worrisome now for a for a malignant tumor if it turns out to be and the oh, has complicated but when the... a biopsy has to be done it has, but I, another point, you know, and, and um, Prakash was constantly mentioning this about image guided versus not, etc. Here, it has to be image guided through those solid areas uh, that we specifically see. The dark areas, uh, uh, you know, at the periphery is what we need to biopsy to find out exactly what it is. But I'm really, really worried about a malignant tumor here. So, so maybe uh, Dr. Satish Mutha can also contribute, like, if this is things, uh, these are the cases which is more commonly seen in an orthopedic clinic. There is one question from on the chat. What is the best way to biopsy here? Do a CT guided biopsy or a J needle biopsy? Or no, no, since it's a J needle to be done CT guided, put it that way. Because this is an easily accessible area, so do you need yeah, a but CT How do you know which one is that solid component you're going through, right? This is a very specific mm -hmm. part, area that you need to biopsy. Anyway, I will, it's not for me to answer as well because this will be referred by the orthopedic surgeon. So I don't know, Prakash, Manish, um, uh, Chetan, you all need to talk about the biopsy as well. Right, right, right. Honestly, in these cases, we would prefer to do it, you know, ourselves, maybe CM guided. Uh, but yes, if, you know, there are a lot of cystic areas, it makes sense to be able to identify and target the solid areas. 
but in this case i would probably you know do it myself there is uh, one more question on the chat from the audience then won't it be nice to you know do a um, image intensifier guided biopsy and and look at yeah, the yeah yeah image frozen, intensifier exactly and look at the frozen and take the frozen is not an option you know that is so easily available to everybody frozen if you have the option are, it would be great yeah. but in a practical situation in you know our kind of practice we don't get frozen that easily are there particular areas of the tumor that you would like to aim for so that you get a proper diagnosis because now this case is complicated it will with the factors it will help us it will help us to uh, uh, to make sure that we have got the adequate representative tissue correct uh, let's let, let me put it this way that if you have a frozen section you should use it because it will ensure that you will get representative tissue but if you don't have frozen section then i think a ct guided biopsy is 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 better because there is less chance of getting a negative biopsy because you can target the solid areas from the x ray see this looks like a benign lesion because it's a very well defined uh, lesion which has fractured and any young patient with a fracture we have to assume that this is going to be a primary bone tumor or a primary bone lesion rather than metastatic uh, lesion so that's one difference is that we should not go ahead and do surgery at this time and without getting a diagnosis and i think it was very correctly pointed out uh, by pandeep that this these are not an emergency even though there is a fracture you need to have a full workup so i think it it is it is very wrong to go in without a biopsy that is for sure now how you do the biopsy depends on what kind of facilities you have and now if you if you have frozen section and you can take it into the theater and do it by all means a surgeon can do it but for somebody who doesn't have frozen section i think it is best to get it to get a ct guided biopsy which is targeted at the solid areas one more okay. question on the chat uh, sorry it may not be entirely related are there any tumor markers in the blood that can be used for any of these tumors to aid the diagnosis Mm. well from the previous case we know that for anything which looks benign you must get an alkaline phosphatase and a serum calcium level at least done because at least that helps in ruling out something metabolic if if at all this is a metabolic condition now other than that for malignancy is for sarcomas there are no tumor markers so let's not waste time on the, on on that i think the simplest thing then is to do a targeted biopsy biopsy as seems to be the consensus here and as has been stressed throughout the talk today the next step is to do a biopsy and not rush in for a surgery so so a genital biopsy was done and uh, it was analyzed by musculoskeletal pathologist who said that the features are suggestive of a giant cell tumor of bone so now that we know know the diagnosis so now what is the next step that we have is the management and what are the options in front of us so do we do do we go ahead with the curettage or because there is a fracture do we resect it so maybe some of the senior members could try and enlighten us as to how to go about it well in a young patient you should always try and save the joint and, and from the x ray at least it looks like there is enough bone to be able to put back the joint with articular congruity yeah. now uh, I, I would do a CT scan in, in these cases and just make sure that I will be able to uh, get art, uh, anatomical uh, alignment and then be able to cure the tumor and and then reconstruct it with what we generally prefer is a sandwich reconstruction. We add a little bone in the areas of the subchondral part where there is not enough subchondral bone and and then we use cement in the rest of the area and there will definitely be need for using fixation. so i think the important thing is to first make an assessment whether it would be possible to save the knee and here again i want to stress two important things is that uh, a, a pathological fracture in a giant cell tumor does not mean that you need a resection every time everything every case has to be managed on its merit and it also does not mean that if there is a pathological fracture the local recurrence rates are going to be very high in fact uh, the rates are reasonably low to be able to try and conserve uh, the patient where the bone stock allows you to do that 
in the MRI there was a particular sequence where these uh, the the hematoma which has done, gone into the synovium and as Bhavin sir also mentioned it has extended into the joint. Does does that change any of the management uh, options for us, or how do we address that? See, an intraarticular hematoma in a GCT, in my experience, has not caused a problem. Now, if there is an obvious inoculation of tumor on the synovium, we have seen this in a couple of cases, then we excise that part out. But a contamination of the joint in a benign tumor is not an indication for doing a resection of the joint. I think you can give a good wash, you can clean the tumor, get the get. I think here the, the tumor debulking, curettage, removal is has to be meticulous. And you have to spend a lot of time on clearing the tumor rather than worrying about fixation. See, as orthopedic surgeons, the mind generally thinks only of fixation. We don't really think about how we are going to clear the disease, whereas the outcome of this patient is going to depend equally on disease clearance as well as the fixation. So we normally say that you have to spend good amount of time and in cases like this, we often end up spending almost 45 minutes to an hour to just clean up the tumor before we even think of starting the reconstruction. There is a question, Manish, on the chat. Uh, apart from meticulous curettage of the lesion, what are the other modalities you can use to further strengthen your clearance, like chemical or... Uh, well, I think, I think we have discussed this every time we discuss giant cell tumors, is that you must use all the modalities that you have. Let's put it this way. And, and the most important or the absolute must is that you must have a bird. And I think without, without having a high-speed bird, the surgery should just not be done because you don't get adequate clearance uh, from the bone. Now, in, in, in a case like this, where we know that there is a tumor spillage, I think you can use something very easily like hydrogen peroxide, which is also an extremely good chemical adjuvant. So having a burr and having hydrogen peroxide generally may be enough. But if you wish, you could use phenol, you could use uh, argon plasma cautery, you could use cryo. But all these things are not absolutely necessary. A burr is something which is absolutely necessary and hydrogen peroxide is easily available and can easily be added as a chemical adjuvant. And cement? Sorry. Well, cement is not a adjuvant. Remember that cement is to be used as a filler. We are not using cement to control the disease. Cement is being used to fill up the gap and to avoid the need of taking too much of the autograft or needing too much of the allograft in this situation. So, so cement is, you don't depend on cement to clear the disease. That is, that would be a very wrong concept. That's why I said that you have to spend first adequate time in clearing the disease and then, then reconstruct it in any way that you like. And in young people, often we have not used cement. We have actually used only bone. So we've used just struts of uh, bone graft to reconstruct the whole cavity back along with fixation. Brings us to the next question. Like, if we have decided now to salvage the joint and we have decided to cure it, as, so what? What do we do? Do we use an allograft in this? Do we use a bone cement, or do we not attempt salvage and try for a mega processor? Well, uh, see, remember, allograft is again just a material to reconstruct. Now we are not talking of an osteoarticular allograft here because we are we are talking about saving the joint. Sure. So an allograft, if you want to use as a material to reconstruct the cavity, you could use it. But remember that allograft takes a long time to incorporate. That is something you have to keep in mind. And that's the reason why most of the times in these cases where I want a quick restoration or quick healing, I would prefer an autograft fibula if I have to use rather than an allograft. But you could use a sandwich reconstruction where you just use a small amount of bone in the subcondyl area and cement in the rest of the cavity as well. And that works equally well. A lot of people use just cement. If you have enough of subcondyl bone, if you have a couple of millimeters of bone, that may be enough to just, just pack it with cement so that you've got good articular congruity and then put in a plate and, and get joint restoration, anatomical joint restoration. The important thing is to start movement early, to get good fixation and to start movement early. If you put this patient into a cast, 
for months then you are going to end up losing the battle on all fronts because you will neither get movement nor nor you will get the benefit of operating on on this page so, so these are the okay. that, yes yes sir can you proceed and finish so that yeah. we can you know cover yeah, yes, sir. one yes, more sir. maybe one or two more things so, so yeah, the plan that yes yeah. so that the plan that we finalized on was an extended curettage with the cementing with plating so this was after uh, debulking the tumor and uh, washing it and then doing the birth and after that as sir mentioned we have to do an extensive lavage to clear out all that hematoma and to clear out all the joint and uh, post that we fix the uh, broken fragment first with the uh, cannulated cantilever screws to the main fragment and then put in the plate to stabilize the whole fragment and then we have inserted bone cement into the cavity so this was an intra op picture if you can see that at the notch there seems to be a defect but that is because we have put a gel foam there so that it it, it just gives the support and it doesn't communicate directly with the intra articular part and uh, these are the post op radiographs so the message from this is obviously to keep the steps that has been harped upon on throughout this talk imaging is important always go ahead once the biopsy is confirmed and after the complete workup and as sir was stressing pathological fracture is not a contraindication for salvage in this case where we know that it's a benign disease and has a good prognosis thank you thank you so much prateek i think thank now we will probably come to the last case of the uh, day uh, sir agarwal sir can you present does anybody case? else want to present i have had my chance to talk does anybody <laughs> else have a case to anybody else if anybody else is not interested i have a case that i can show it's quite a nice uh, yeah okay, okay. both can go through it quickly because yeah quite interesting yeah so let me just uh, can you see that yeah yeah so this is a 19 year old girl with left knee pain since 2 to 3 months pain was progressively increasing and uh, an x ray was done and this is what we could see on the x ray uh, dr jankaria would you like to just briefly comment on this x ray 19 years old girl yeah so um, expansile osteolytic lateral condyle does not reach the articular surface sclerotic rim so the first mm -hmm. diagnosis would be an aneurysmal bone cyst okay but benign looking pathology yes there's a sclerotic rim so benign looking right 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 so this is what the x ray was reported as uh, a well defined multilocular lucent lesion with sclerotic rim noted eccentrically in the distal femoral metaphysis probably in nof would you agree with that nof uh, no 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 it's not an nof <laughs> okay, this is okay. clearly not okay. one thing we can agree is this is not a non ossifying fibroma <laughs> right so what are the differentials now okay we come to the mri so this is what the mri is showing so I no mano edema sharply yes. defined fluid level cystic looking if you have contrast and we can prove that it's a pure cyst then that is it dark on t2 it's bright on t2 oh one it looks, you know that's a, so the top row is t1 and the bottom middle is a fat sat bottom it it all seems to be t1 so it all it seems to be all t1 okay. dark And the Let's next see, one. The next one. Yeah. Yeah, and again, PD fats. These are all that I have. I think these are T1. Bhavin, those previous images are T2. Go and back. Go T2, back. So. Go back. No, that's all fluid. If you see the cartilage, uh, it's all uh, intermediate signal. So T2, the cartilage would this be dark. Is darker than PD. Okay. So these are either PD fats, sir, but that's okay. So then it's still inter. Do we have contrast, Chetan? uh i don't know i just basically put up what all images i had which all you know showed it well i don't you know, think there is move on we got a benign looking yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but it doesn't have so, classic features of any you know so yeah it doesn't have fluid yeah. levels you are seeing fluid levels in it yes on yeah. one fluid level i like the most you would still call it a abc no so now i have a problem calling it an abc because i'm not seeing multiple fluid levels i'm seeing possibly one 
and I'm not even sure whether it's a pure cyst because as as Manish said, you know, between T1 and T2, we weren't sure whether it's dark or intermediate. And we don't have a contrast study, so I don't know whether it's solid enhancing or cystic. So all these things are a challenge. There's also some marrow edema, which um, needs to be looked at. Um, having said mm -hmm. that, the X-ray appearance was highly suggestive of a surface or a cortical ABC, but uh, the MR is is kind of throwing us off. Yeah. Well, I think condom exoid fibroma is something which we would keep in differential. We would, we would, yes, yes. With, with this kind of an eccentric location. Yeah. Anyway, so needs a biopsy, and then we yeah. So, uh, ouch! Unfortunately, she was not biopsy. So this were the notes from what procedure was done. So this was thought of as a left distal femur cystic lesion query ABC. Intralesional curettage of the cyst with biopsy plus artificial bone grafting was done. Post op was uneventful, and that is her post op X ray. Now, this tissue was sent for histopath in that same hospital, and the report was features of a low grade sarcoma, possibly a low grade central osteosarcoma with focal de differentiation. That was the report. So, what do you think? So I would have my problems calling this an osteosarcoma because uh, it does have a sclerotic rim and uh, the appearance that we see is very, I'm not seeing any osteoid at all. I'm seeing some trabeculae. So I would question the histopathology as well, get another opinion on okay. that, make sure we're on okay. uh, par. But like I said, this also didn't really look like an ABC on the MRI. So at the end of the day, right. Uh, you do have 5% of cases where everything goes haywire and then, you know, if the histopath is confirmed by two names, uh, then we would go with that. Correct. I would also think so, of a dysplastic fibroma. I mean, it's, it's not something mm -hmm. which, uh, I mean, it's low signal. You don't see any bone formation. So without mm -hmm. any uh, osteoid or bone formation, if, if the pathologist categorically sees osteoid, Osteoid, then I think I would agree with that. But without seeing that, it is very difficult to agree with the diagnosis of osteosarcoma. Correct. And low so grade osteosarcoma, so, so it's not something which I, I would buy very easily, not unless there is convincing evidence. So, second opinion was taken, and that was reported as fibroblastic osteogenic sarcoma. And because again, this was, you know, I mean, here, you know, I don't know whether it's a desmoplastic fibroma because that is often confused with a, with something like this. So, so right. when you say second opinion, I assume the second opinion was from a experienced pathologist who sees absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, that other... without the sarcoma, because once you see atypical cells, and once the pathologist tells you that these these, these are sarcomas. Then you accept the diagnosis of a sarcoma. So, in fact, a third opinion was then taken from another, you know, eminent pathologist. So now it has become a conventional fibroblastic osteosarcoma, grade three. So it started with a low grade ABC to low grade, then fibroblastic, and now it is conventional. It almost looks I like that tumor is going within the slide. <laughs> it is changing its character as, as it is seriously from pathologist to pathologist. Yeah. But this was finally agreed upon as a conventional fibroblastic osteosarcoma. So she was uh, given chemotherapy. Staging investigations were done. There were no metastasis. Patient received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. She had to undergo five cycles because of the COVID issues. She then underwent limb saving surgery. The final histopath confirmed that this it was a PET CT done. Sometimes I use a PET CT to guide me because the huh. SUV max often is a good guide to tell you how much is the metabolic activity within the lesion. No, PET and was done after the PET was done after the sec first surgery. So there was nothing much actually to guide us with that. It was basically more for staging. So she underwent a knee replacement. So the lesson is don't assume a diagnosis based on imaging alone. Don't trust the radiology report blindly. Don't do a definitive procedure while attempting to establish a diagnosis. And just to add, don't trust FNAC for a primary diagnosis. Although this girl's limb could be saved, the unnecessary and harmful procedure has certainly compromised her prognosis besides draining her resources. 
Now, just uh, an exercise to everybody. This is a 59 years old gentleman with an X-ray showing a lower end femur lesion. This is a 25 year old lady with a similar looking lesion in the lower end of femur, and this is a 39 year old lady. Are these GCT or not? Anybody can participate. Dr. Jankaria, mm -hmm. you are the radiology expert. Mm -hmm. I think he had to leave for another oh, is webinar. It? Okay, 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 yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, anyway, should, should, I will uh, try to wind up quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is a giant cell rich sarcoma. This is a giant cell tumor of bone. And this is a high grade, poorly differentiated sarcoma. So, the lesson is don't assume a diagnosis based on imaging alone. Don't trust the radiology report blindly and don't do a definitive procedure while attempting to establish a diagnosis. This is the last uh, you know, case. This is a 23-year-old gentleman who came with pain around knees of four months duration while working in the field. He suffered a pathological fracture. GCT or not? Well, a biopsy was done and it was suggestive of osteogenic carcinoma. Now, do you agree? Osteogenic carcinoma. Osteogenic carcinoma. So, based on this osteogenic carcinoma, patient received three cycles of chemotherapy and has admitted for a bony amputation. He actually ran away from the hospital and came all the way to Mumbai, got a review of the histopathology at Tata Memorial, and it was reported as giant cell tumor of bone. So, the message is again, don't blindly trust the histopathology report either. Reaching a diagnosis is really the responsibility of the treating doctor. You should correlate all the imaging, clinical, and histological findings, and then only you know come to a conclusion about what is the diagnosis. So the lesson is bone tumors are rare. Inexperienced pathologists may not diagnose the condition correctly. Please send a biopsy sample to a specialist. Inexperienced surgeons only complicate matters for the patient. Remember, it is not about your surgical skills. When I say inexperienced surgeons, I mean inexperienced as related to bone tumors. Good surgeons know how to operate, better ones know when to operate and the best when not to operate. Do not treat tumors casually. Your patient's life and limb depends on it. Thank you. Thank you, Chetan. Thank you, sir. I think we can wind up. Yes, uh, it was a really wonderful session, Chetan, because tumors is one thing we don't hear always and we Thank still you. have a lot of confusions in our mind. You and the excellent faculty have managed to clear a lot of air about the doubts that we have. It was a really wonderful so question. And uh, as Neeraj tells me, there are more, more than 1,600 people logged in, which is really wow. wonderful. Uh, yes, I wish to thank Bhavin and Manish who taken out, taken time out on a Sunday morning and spent three and a half hours with us. And the remaining faculty, Yogesh, Pratik, Chetan, Michel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Pratik. Thank Neeraj for extending Pleasure, the support through thank his you so much and Thank all the faculty to improve the outreach. Yes. yes. And also, yes. there are for supporting this academic endeavor of ours. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank Dr. Pratik. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Manish. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice Sunday. Thank you. Have Thank a you. nice Sunday. Bye-bye. Yeah. I see you. Thanks.